Hello everyone, it's uh, Oz Property Investors Wednesday Night Live. We bring the big names and the big, big fun. How, how are you out there, everybody? How's your, uh, how's your days? We, we had some technical difficulties. The property bros had to uh, had to suit up and get excited. I don't have my suit on, but how are you going, Joe? How's your day, mate? Mate, I'm fantastic. I'm ready to rock and roll with this um, sensational live. This one is all about taking it back to the roots of what this... What we used to be is just two blokes talking about property, having a couple of beers, and uh, just talking good quality property stuff. So um, that's what this session is all about. It's all about just bringing the value to the people um, that we have in this group. It, the group has grown exponentially, absolutely out of this world, how many people we thought there would be. So we must be doing something good. So all I want to do today is you provide a whole heap of value and I provide a whole heap of value. Um, I also want this group, this chat to be a whole heap of back and forth with the audience, guys. So everyone, pop in your property comments. We're going to be talking about st strategy, investing, um, renovation, development, subdivision, and uh, providing a whole heap of value in that time. So we've got now together, so let's make the most of it. But Jeff, how has your day been, mate? How are you? How's your end of financial year been? Mate, pretty chilled, actually, uh, which I know is gonna, you, you're going to absolutely hate that. I've just been, uh, been kind of doing, uh, doing some things here and there. Got to be busy towards the end of the day, and it is going to get busier. So I, I, was, uh, I was racing to get the property down in Adelaide, set the last one settled, so I didn't have to do two tax returns. That would have been was supposed to settle on the 2nd of July, so... Um, yeah, really good day. Fantastic. Looking forward to the next project. Made some money. Going to keep making some money. And I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that in development as well as we go on. So keen to, That's get, crazy, keen to man. get cracking. So. That's crazy. Yeah. Sold the development. It's done. It's done. Wash your hands with it. You've got some money. You've got some honey. All about the wheeling and dealing life, you. Yeah, oh God, exactly. You're and, uh, yeah, no, you're going to be good. having some chats over the next couple of <laughs> so yeah, well, let's 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 uh, let's crack straight into the life hacks for the, the property brothers uh, session. Let's. Uh, uh, do you want to go first? Or you want me to, I, I got a really no. Cool you go. One. You, you really go first. Cause, yeah, you go first because my life hack. I need to share my screen with it. Um. So so cool. we'll do that. We'll do that. Okay. Uh, so you, what's you your life see, hack? You're going to see Joe picking his nose soon as, as his screen freezes. But so my life hack for this week and um, is is actually. It's something that's it's quite important and it's more of a security life hack as well. So when I say security, so I'm talking about two-factor authentication, which sounds super Ooh. basic, right? You're like, who the, who the heck isn't doing two-factor two authentication? And I've recently sort of started doing some sort of uh, some, some security stuff that I need to, and I'm just like, wow, although this is a pain, the pain in the neck to do it, pain in the backside, I just think it's, it's absolutely vital because unless somebody kidnaps me and I have my phone on me, then that way, maybe that, yeah, sure, they could get me to hack into stuff. But we use passwords and we underestimate how easy it is to hack. I mean, property one, two, three, hash, hashtag, whatever it is, people's uh, passwords are. I don't know. That's that's not any of our passwords. But yeah, that's my mm -hmm. life hack two, two factor authentication. What about that's you, Joe? Good. That is yeah. good, mate. I like that little life hack. It's so true. Um, you can get access to a lot of uh, a lot of stuff if you if you know how to do it. Um, I was watching on the little TikTok, and uh, there was like there's like a whole hacker thread, and it's people just hacking into people's Gmails, and it's so super easy to do. Um, so if you've got those type of measures in place, you ain't gonna get in trouble. Um, what is my life hack? Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen with you now. This is actually I'm just gonna do. Tell me when you see my screen. I see you, Joe. Wow. Wow. One big thing is that what it says here. Uh, yeah, I, I like I, my work when I like my steak. Oh. Like I like my steak. Well done. So this is just a motivational <laughs> thing that comes up every day to focus on one big thing. Now, this isn't what I want to share. What I want to share is, Jeff, you and I, we're always constantly going back and forth and we're always creating Excel spreadsheets, sorry, Google Slides, Google Sheets, Google Docs, right? How annoying is it to open your drive, log into the thing, blah, blah, blah. Pisses me off, if I'm to be fair. What you do doc dot new enter it automatically realizes what account i'm logged into creates a new google doc sheets wow. dot new there you oh, go. Hey Jeff, i'm just going to crutch a couple of numbers blah 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 sheets dot new creates a new sheet slides dot new creates a new slide that's 
That is a life hack. That, my friends, is a life hack. I tell you what else is a life hack. Um, Mr. Now, are we going on to sponsors? Is that what happens next? Yeah, that's, 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 I mean, you didn't even give me an opportunity to tell you how cool your life hack was. But um, Oh, yeah, yeah. Guess, tell me, how cool was my life hack? No, no, it, that was um, the, the only thing I was, I, I just, uh, yeah, that's why I get so many documents from you because I'm like, oh, she's created another one. Just like, let's, let's just, yeah, but no, that, it, it is amazing. <laughs> it's fantastic. The audience is coming. What about saving it so you can find it later? Yeah, how do you how do you do that, Joe? How, can you do that? Like, can we can we expand it? Like, I know this isn't the purpose of this, but can you save it? Can you find it later? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, so it just saves. So what you would do is you do. Oh, I'm not sharing anymore. But what you do is then it would be in like the it would be at like the top space of wherever all your like you just open your thing up straight away. They'll be right there. So it'll save automatically to your thing. You just need to do a little bit of organization and uh, and plop it wherever you need it to be. You know how organized I am, so I could, I could get that sorted. So speaking of saving, I think it is time to save save our save our Oz property some money. Let's do okay. it, Joe. We have a sensational um, sponsor. Sensational sponsor, Scotty Agate. We're from Hello House. Joe, Joe's going to get it up. One, geez, that sounds funny. Get up. <laughs> hope, the kid, hope the kids are in bed. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get the uh, – how, how are you going with that screen share, Joe? Oh, absolutely terrible. Um, I can't find the, the right – the right thing so mate keep continuing on have you got another here we go finally god god help i, me. I do have another life hack but uh, I, I was going to save it till next week sorry you you, you you're taking me out of my life hacks. now throw some comments what, what does everybody want to i've got some preloaded questions in the audience so joe's got it he's got his he's got his screen of death here he's about to he's kicking something off i think so i need Let's to shut up joe We've seen him on the 7 p.m. project campaigning against agent underquoting. Scott is an expert negotiator through and through. Every single day, he is negotiating with real estate agents to get the best price for his clients. To give you a bit of a background, Scott has been working in real estate since 1995 and as a real estate agent, built up three Bell franchises. He was the guy teaching the agent all the tips and tricks to get the most out of the buyers. However, Scott realized that there was actually no one on the side of the person buying the property and he saw them constantly letting emotion get in the way and paying way over for the property. And that's why he created Hello House, Australia's first property negotiation as a service business where he is on the side of the buyer. In hot markets like we have now, you need absolutely every single edge that you can get. These agents are trained professionals and they are there to get the most money out of you which is why you need to have an expert of your own in your own corner. The way it works, you find the property, then Scott will come in at the negotiation phase and take over for you. This is how you'll get the property for its true value. He'll ensure that you don't overpay. He comes in, knocks the real estate agent down on price, no more agent games, no more tricks, no more tactics. He is there for you. Scott has been kind enough to offer us an amazing discount on his service, and I've personally just seen a friend pay $20,000 more on a property because of these agent games. Reach out to him with the link below. It'll be the best property investment you will ever make. Thanks very much, Joe. That was uh, that was good good tech, mate, good tech. So let's let's get into the presentation. That's Joe's been uh, I'm playing. I'm playing. Whoa, geez, what's going on there? Jesus. Yes, you sharing your screen. Is that you, mate? Yeah, oh, that's, that's you. I'll, I'll, I'll kick you out. So before we let, I'll, I'll give you a bit of an intro. Let's let's kind of so as um, the 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 interesting thing in the lead up to this, as I'm sharing my screen, the lead up, I was I, I was completely in the dark as to what Step Brothers was. I heard of the movie, of course, but I'd never seen it. So I'm like, okay, cool, Property Brothers sounds good. I was watching the movie. I'm like, oh man, I, I feel I feel like a uh, I felt like I've been tricked. I was, uh, I was, I was. I feel like I was being stitched up by by uh, by good old Chris Dusting. Now this this, this whole session is the Catalina fucking wine mixer. That is what this session is all about. This is the property Catalina wine mixer. So everybody get prepped for some good stuff here. Um, we've spent a couple of hours. Well, I've spent probably too long on this, and then I do all this prep work, and we—I don't look into any of it. I just roll off the off the cuff. So, Jeff, what are we gonna cover off today? So here we go. Here, here's the here's the here's the sexy image of my my mug on there. So, and we've got this session here, June FY, the Property Brothers, one time only. I was gonna say one time only, but we might actually do it again. Let's get into it. We've done the life hacks. 
So let's let's give you a, a run through. We're going to talk about the top three insights from our journeys or journey. Yeah, it should be journeys. Mind the typo there, people. To date, and then we're going to have a strategy overview. So we're going to talk about each each part, each kind of strategy we kind of have, uh, and and our views and, and interpretations of when it when it, when when and where it should be worked. And and top three insights from interviewing our guests, and then it asks us anything. We've already got about five or six questions. Just jump in though, throw us some questions. We've got a little bonus at the end. We'll see how long. Which we, we were saying we might try and run this in an hour, but I think it'll run an hour and fifteen or an hour and a half. We'll see how we go. So, but questions, questions, give them to us now. We won't answer. We'll answer them as we're going along, and just throw. We want this to be interactive. We want to add yeah. so much value that you'll keep coming back. So that's a bit pixelated yeah. anyway. The more questions so, you ask. The more questions you ask, the more engaging this gets. Okay, cool. So the three insights that I want to share are pretty savage, really. <laughs> Don't fuck it up. Keep your strategy simple and take your investing seriously. So um, what do I mean by that, right? What do I mean by don't fuck it up? Well, I wanted to take a step back and look at the numbers. So there are 2,207,905 2 million, yeah, 2 million, 200,000 people that invest Sorry, in property in Australia. There we go. So that is about 20% of prop, uh, 20% of the population have an investment property. So out of that 20%, 71% of those people own one investment, 19% own two, 6% own three, uh, 4% own two. Sorry. So 2% own four, so 1% own five, and less than 1% own six or more properties. We should have had so, that one the table on the screen. Sorry, Joe, but go on. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, that's a great idea, actually. Look, we can still do that. We're not gonna, we can still do with With technology, we can pump these numbers up here, guys. Look, there you go. These are the numbers, right? So... It's pretty crazy, right? Um, what I kind of see with this, get my stupid little face out of there, um, is that these people have fucked it up, you know? If your goal is to invest in property, right, your goal is to build a multi-million dollar portfolio, 71% have fucked it up, 19% have fucked it up, 3%, 6% have fucked it up, 4 5 and 6% properties that's where you start to kind of make a difference within your life that's when you can start to see some real results so if we add all that to if we add most of that up together up to about four that's 96 percent of property investors have fucked it up and that's Jesus, what i'm mate. he's reading the f bombs like come on man there's kids i know I, <laughs> okay so what i'm trying to get at is obviously I'm being a little bit dramatic here because obviously 90 people that have one are on their way to make two and on their way to make three and on the way to make four. But the way you do it is by just not treading on the landmines that are out there in the industry. So people keep falling for the same things over and over and over again. And I think I've got this in my section uh, below further down, but don't... um. Just don't fall for these traps. And these traps are just the stock standard things you keep hearing about um, that stop you from going forward. Like your first property is one of the most important properties that you purchase. The next most important property is the second one that you buy, the third one you buy. So when you're buying, don't get like, uh, the way I like to think about it is like a filter, right? When, you, when you're trying to get something out of a lake, you, you throw a big net and you try and catch everything, right? Um, how about you just throw throw the net and it has things that it catches like off the plan apartments, house and land packages, mining town, one industry locations, just totally remove those. Now, I know that there are great opportunity. There are some opportunities in house and land packages. There are some opportunities in off the plans. There are some opportunities in mining towns. But if you go for one, if you, if you just take them all off, you'll have a better opportunity to get better results. So I think I think so, what Joe's saying is focus on focus on mastering one thing rather than trying to say look. And if, if that happens to be like I, I tend to agree with pretty much all of Joe's what, what Joe said there. But if you're going to do house and land package, don't don't go and don't go to some person who's who's getting paid keep getting kicked back by a developer. Really master it and absolutely own that and really understand everything there is to do about it. Absolutely, if you're going to do buy and hold in and 
existing property. Absolutely own that. Um, sorry, Joe, I'm still in thunder. These are your insights. Sorry, bro. No, mate. No, no. But I guess what I'm trying to say is if you're trying to look at a property, right, um, rather than having a look at everything, right, try and whittle it down. Oh, I'm looking at all of Australia. I can buy all of Australia. Well, what's your budget? Oh, my budget's 400000 All of a sudden, all of Australia, Australia becomes this narrow focus. Okay, great. Well, what states are in the right side of the cycle that I want? Do a little bit of research on that. And then it narrows down your scope of the properties. And if you just remove off the plan apartments from your categories of what you look at, you've just saved yourself having to look at all those properties which then means you've got a narrower focus for you to hone in on the top properties. Um, so that's my insight on don't F it up is that you don't want to be able to purchase these terrible investments, remove them from your screen entirely and focus on the stuff that is good. Um, can, can, I, can I jump in, Joe? Sorry, um, before, because I, I, I promised our, we promised our, our other admin, Nick, that I'd tell us about how we met. And I'm sort of, I'm backtracking here. So we're going to have to kind of, Mate, you talk about three or four minutes on that inside there, but so I'm going to do this in about <laughs> 30, 30 seconds. Yeah, we're going to, oh, you were worried about Go this. on, mate. Drop Having it. How did we meet? So here we go. So the origin story, it, it was it was 2018. It was a rainy day. It was it was very cold. It was lonely. We were in a room. There was kind of sh – no, there was, I was going to say the sharks are bound. But, but no, in, in all in – all, uh, it was Joe, Joe and I, we, we locked eyes across the room. No, there wasn't any of that bullshit. I don't even actually remember talking to Joe at this conference, but somehow – some way by by rook or by crook, we ran into each other. Twenty eighteen, um, Stevie Knight Mega Mil Millionaire Mega Conference ran into each other, and as they say, the rest is history. Here we are, a couple of years later, um, we're just kind of building building a brand, building whatever it is this Oz Property Investors is. So that's our origin story, how we actually got kicked off. That was three years ago, roughly, almost to the day I would say, um, because I got a reminder about this the other day about meeting Kate Bakos. So it was pretty oh, much three right. years. To our, uh, I'm pretty sure we shook hands. We pounded the flesh when he could do that. That sounds funny, pounded the flesh. Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> sorry. No, we, 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 uh, we shook hands or whatever, yeah, back when he could do that pre-COVID. But, um, yeah, so that's the origin story. So insight number two from Joe, and I'm going to limit you for probably – No, let's not, let's not do that. Let's jump to your insight. Let's jump – let's do one, 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 right? My insight, your insight, your insight, my insight. Okay, I'll go. I'll go to, I'll, I'm going to. What's jump your this. insight number one? Oh, look how happy I am! <laughs> <laughs> what did I do with the? Uh, what did I do with the bloody? Oh, mate, oh, I've, I've lost three, three bloody things open. You need to. Yeah, I've, I've lost. I've lost the bloody presentation. Go to face. Well. Go to facey and and go to that link you sent me. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, mate, what have I done? I've closed we, the window. We used to think we were professionals. Twenty-one yeah. people are viewing this. Hello to everyone. I'm surprised. Yeah. I'm surprised with our amateur hour, what we've been doing technology wise. You've stayed yeah. on, so we appreciate that. We're going to bring some there value soon. I promise. <laughs> so my my uh, my my number one insight number is adding, and this is going to contradict what Joe's going to say. So this is what I love about us. You don't always agree on everything, and I'll clarify. So my first point on top three insights is adding value or having the ability to do so is so vital. Um, so that kind of if you're buying let's say, how, uh, something, uh, the, the finished product uh, from somebody, you don't have the ability to, 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 you have very limited ability to build a granny flat out the back or, or do a subdivision or do a renovation. If you're buying, an, even if you're buying a unit, you can't, you, you, you're, you're locked into that. And, and the reason why I feel that's, that's my own journey. Like my, the first property I bought was a, was a townhouse and, and I, I, there's not a lot I can do with that. I bought the finished product. Somebody else has already squeezed out all the value from that, from that purchase. And subsequently that, that property, and, and it's, it's been rented. So I would say now looking at the values of the areas, it's lucky to, it's probably gone up maybe 10 to, maybe lucky 10% in, in five years. So it's almost done nothing. So, and, and I've had to then get a bit creative about the way I've, so if, whereas if I had the ability to subdivide, build something at the back, I would then sort of, I, I would be able to say, okay, I could, I could force some equity from that. And sure, that's going to cost you money. Um, so that's kind of my number one insult uh, from okay. that. So got any thoughts I like on that, that. I like that, man. That's kind of like one of the things that I always like to say is um, don't buy the end product, right? 
don't buy something that you can't add value to. Buy a product that needs a renovation, that needs a, a lick of paint, that needs a um, an extension, that can be subdivided, that can have development opportunity down the line because that's what you're trying to build. You're trying to build a portfolio that you can keep building on and adding value throughout the year. So, mate, I'm all about this uh, insight number one. Sensational. Thank you, mate. Yeah, and, and I'll just I'll, I'll quantify that by saying, look, of, of course you can make money in, 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 prop, in the end products, if you're going to do that, you really, I'll, I'll talk to it on point number three. So back to yeah. you, Joe. Right, back to you. Okay. Um, strategy number two. Uh, well, whatever these things are called, right? Insight number two. Mine is keep keep your strategy simple. Now, going back to when we first met, we were talking to Steve McKnight. He has a saying that says, "Make the most amount of prop, uh, make the most amount of money in the quickest amount of time with the least amount of risk with the greatest." Oh, fuck. The least amount of aggravation. Least amount of aggravation. Most money, yeah. least amount the of lowest. time, the lowest risk and the least amount of aggravation. So yeah. what I like to do is have my strategy in a clear, simple, easy sentence to understand. So this is this is my one. Use as little of my own money as possible by borrowing other people's money to build a large asset base in the quickest amount of time while making the properties the most affordable to hold right? So use other people's money as little of my own money to borrow other people's money to build an asset base that I can do in the quickest amount of time and make sure that it's as easy to as hold as possible. Does that yeah. make sense? It, it does though. I, I, I suppose there are the, um, this, uh, I'll, I'll caveat this, this is not financial advice folks, um, but um, yeah, you, you've, got, you've got to do what's comfortable for you. That, that's kind of what I would say. If Joe's comfortable doing that and, and look, I'm probably at the start of your journey, I tend to agree, and I'm, I've, I've been quite similar, borrowed quite a lot. Um, as I've gone through and seen uh, over the last sort of 10 years throughout my journey, I've sort of seen um, sort of a, a slight ups and downs. And if you don't sell, you're probably not going to see it. Again, not advice. But, yeah, tend to agree with that, Joe. So let's yeah. – um, what are you at? 20 minutes, mate. Oh, you want to? I mean, let's go for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess like thinking about property investing, right? What is the purpose of it? The purpose of property investing is to replace your working income with your passive income. So if you are setting up strategy, if we're talking about strategy, you want to have an end goal, right? Have a point that you want to get to and then reverse engineer that and what it looks like. So how much cash am I making right now and how much money do I need how many properties do I need to get to that same level? That's kind of my strategy. Setting your ultimate goal. What is yours, mate? Don't fuck it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so my so my number two is and this is in no particular order. It's time is either your friend or your foe. So, Ooh, okay. um, the reason why, so, so property, is, you're not gonna go. I mean, most people, there are people out there that have bought 10 properties in, in 18 months. And, and, and those people who have done that, have a look underneath the hood as to what's driven that. It's usually they've got a, a super high income. But my point there is um, to, get, to get to the crux of it is you, you have to um, – property is generally uh, at least a five to ten year investment and even longer. Like who, some people will say they never sell and I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I, I still kind of say it's horses for courses. But um, it's not if – you, if you're expecting to go and make – and there are people out there in the last 12, 18 months that, that have made 30, 40, 50, like a lot of money. And, and I, I'd say that that's, that's an absolute – that's an unprecedented time. So you have to really be patient. And, and if you do, even if you do make a bad investment, be kind to yourself and say, okay, it's not that investment profit, invest, property doesn't work and investing doesn't work. It's more about saying, well, what is it about this thing where I made the mistake? Um, so be so. If you're impatient, though, it will be your foe, as in time will be your foe. So that's Absolutely, my Absolutely, mate. I'm I'm all for that. Um, we, you know, we've had many guests on this podcast on the, whatever the hell you want to call this live sessions. Um, what I really like was Jane Slack Smith. She said, "Meat and potato properties, boring as batshit." That's what she said. Make it as boring. If you want to have some excitement. Go bungee jumping. Property investment is not where your excitement should lie. It should be just letting time do its thing by purchasing assets that are in a location that people want to live and buy in. Yep. Which leads to my third insight, um, kind of actually leaning into what you said, but gone are the days uh, where you can have a 10 plus property portfolio. There's no more low doc, no doc loans. 
um, you need to take property investing as serious as you can. Uh, your first purchase is the most important. Your second purchase is the next most important. But one of the things that I keep hearing and kind of seeing and is just not using professionals. Like use a buyer's agent. You out there are making a, sh a lot of money, right? You're making a lot of money in your profession. You do what you do really well, right? But then all of a sudden you come into the property industry and go out there and try and make all this money when there are all these experts that are so good at what they do, finding locations, distilling the data, um, going out there on the ground, smashing it out. I see a lot of people try and become the next, I don't know, not the next property developer, but like I guess kind of like just just to have fun, right? Oh, yeah, I want to have fun in property. I want to, like, learn all the things. It's no, great. To around, it's, it's around the barbecue. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing this little bit of property investing and it's kind of like a cool in thing. It's like I think people that do that, so, and asking, I, I see that in my own circles and I, and I actually, I ask them a few questions and I just, I try and not be too judgy, but it's it's hard because you're like, well, you're just doing it to because you think it's cool. It's like the in thing to do, buy, buy crypto, buy property, buy whatever thing it is. Yeah, and, and what that ends up is you go out there and buy the property, but you then make a mistake and then you get stuck on one, you're like the other 71%. So to be able to progress, you have to pay, you have to spend real money to make real money. So I am all for, you know, this is why I'm, we keep talking about Scott Agger. This is why we keep talking about Steve Polisi. This is why we keep talking about buyer's agents. They're the experts in finding property. Now, what you should be spending all your time on is one, reading a couple of books, you know, I've got hundreds over here from property investing. Um, maybe not hundreds, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I've got, I've got, I don't know, 30 books on property investing. Learn them, read them, get to that. That's great. And then spend the rest of your time researching the best people in the industry that can go and do the things that you want to do and surround yourself with the experts. Get a good quality mortgage broker, get a good quality accountant, get a good quality buyer's agent. But what you don't want to do is hand over the keys to them and let them drive the vehicle. Um, usually we have a metaphor around that, but that's what I'm kind of going with with that. So what is your number three insight, mate? My number three, Joe, is is going to kind of go, um, it's going to dovetail a little bit into yours, is having a clear framework on knowing how to select your own investment. So if, I, I'm kind of, I'm not anti, I'm, I'm not anti, I'm not pro BA. I'm kind of like, well, what, what is it that, what is it you're trying to achieve from going to that professional? Um, whether, and and I, I'm definitely pro accountant because I, I, I know how, yeah. So my, my point there is, you have to have uh, – I see so many people and I, I see it probably three, four, even sort of ten a week on our forum and, and many on other property forums as well. They ask, well, what do you think about this area? Or, and, they, and they're just they're, – they're, they're sort of – I always see that it's like a – and all, all due respect, it's, I love people learning and asking questions. So it's hard for me to sort of be, be – I mean, not hard, but it, it, I oftentimes get a bit hard, hard on those people because I need to kind of go back to the beginner's mindset. Um, but but just rather than saying is this area a good area, kind of have have five to ten very clear metrics, or even sort of some people have hundreds of metrics, and I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of for five or ten. Um, have those five or ten, and then and then run the area against that metric, and say most metrics, and say, well, okay, is this is this area likely to be to achieve what I want to achieve? And if it's not, then just eliminate it straight away. Um, because why are you why are you folks? It's it's about the filter. Getting back to your number one, like um, don't fuck it up. Um, like what what are your metrics? So that's kind of my uh, that's bring it hitting a home run there. That's my last insight, Joe. Oh, sensational, mate! Sensational. I'm all about a clear framework. All about it. Yeah. What are we doing here? Buy and hold. Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> So um, this session is all about three strategies that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about buy and hold. We're going to talk about renovation, four, four strategies, um, renovation, subdivision, and development. That's what we're going to cover. You, you could argue that subdivision and development is, is kind of the same, but, I mean, well, it's not the same. You could, you could say that yeah, subdivision. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of leaning towards that it's pretty similar, but it's also yeah. not. You can also get some quick subdivision deals going, which are pretty juicy as well. Um, okay, well, let's address this question that we've got here. Do you want to bring it up, Jeff? Let's do it. I'll, I'll, I'll get. I'll work out the tech side of things and get rid of you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm throwing you in the. <laughs> no, no, no. 
So Facebook user, you, you, uh, ah. if you want to read the question and come up with an answer, Joe. Do you have a max number of properties you would recommend? I think anything over seven could become too much. What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think seven properties is probably a bit, that's a lot of properties. I mean, it's not a bit too much, um, but yeah, admitting seven properties. Like I hear, like you look in the media, like 15 properties and he bought 20 properties, he's got 30 properties. It's like, God, that would be a freaking nightmare because you know that they're all low value, low socioeconomic. They're all going to be quick churn of all their leases. Um, so the way that I like to kind of look at this is set up a number of how much you need to earn. So let's just say everyone's kind of roundabout number is $100,000, 120, 150, 200, whatever. Um, but set your number up. Okay, well, how much income does that property give you? Oh, well, um, the property rents for $500 a week, 500 times by 52, um, that is $26,000. Um, that's unencumbered, times that by five, that is a hundred. So you would need five properties unencumbered at um, five hundred dollars a week to give you one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. I think we need a whiteboard, Joe. Like you, you we do, me. yeah, yeah. Too <laughs> many numbers. Too many numbers. But um, what you need to do is is kind of find out what kind of percentage. You actually, it's actually more of a percentage, right? Um, I need to have two million dollars giving me six percent yield um in income so try and rather than the number of properties look about the income that it's going to provide for you that's the way yeah. i like it how would you answer that mate yeah I'd, I'd say the same thing it's it's more about the outcome because uh a mentor of ours steve um he's written a book um what mm -hmm. zero to one zero to one sixty i think it is and and zero to three twenty i think i've stuffed up those numbers that's okay um, and he's wrote, he wrote those books and just hearing from him he said that owning that many properties uh in in was just a hassle. It was. It was kind of, and, and I could just, I could see the, I could see the anguish in his eyes when he, when he talked about having the, the maintenance and having to think about that many properties. Um, and, he, and he just said, he just to your point earlier about keeping it simpler. He simplified the whole process and focused on. He, he, he paid down all of that and just, just looked at commercial property. Uh, and that's not to say the commercial is the way to go. It's, it's just the, his approach. He kind of. He, he got rid of a lot, he cut a lot of the fat from his uh, budget, so to speak, and just just focus on commercial, um, and and right, right, and that 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 delivered him X amount of income, and, and that's what he wanted. Um, so it wasn't about him owning five hundred properties; it was about him saying, "Yeah." So hope that answers your question, Jerry. Thanks for and keep keep. I love I love questions and interactions with the audience. So let's go to your strategy buy and hold, Joe. You've got heaps of um, heaps of content on this, so I want to I want to hear about it. Okay. I mean, it, the, the thing is, this property is just simple. It's simple, but it's not easy. It, that's it. Like everyone's got all the, the, the wheels of wealth, the, you know, the, the trident strategy, the, the, fucking, yeah, so. what's the, what is that other crazy one? Like they've all got these crazy names, but to be honest, you just got to do the logical stuff. So things the like. The triangle from Chris Dusting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. We got push. We got all of that. So um, uh, these are the six things that I kind of see being a whole heap of value when you're looking at a property. Now, strong owner occupier appeal. Everybody says it. What does it mean? Well, owner occupiers are the ones that get emotional about property. So if a property is worth eight hundred thousand dollars, a property investor is going to pay eight hundred thousand dollars. However, if it's in a really good location that is emotionally invested, you're more likely to scrap the budget and your partner's going to say, hey, look, I really, really want this property. It's going to be great for the kids. It's got the nice place out the back. And then that bids up the price. So the reason you want your investment property to be like that is because it's going to bring the renters. It's not, sorry, it's going to bring the emotional it's going to be in the same league as an owner, what an owner occupier would want and drag up the value with that. So it, rather than being in this market where it's just for renters, it's more about bringing that up. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think for me, um, it, it's kind of um, have, having, having bought a PPR, I kind of, you look at it completely differently or having sort of helped with PPR. You look at it completely differently, Joe, from a uh, from a from an investment. Like investment is all about numbers, and don't get me wrong, the invest the numbers have to make sense. If the numbers don't make sense, I don't I don't care if it's got 
if it's got um, purple, I mean, I don't care if it's got the best schools and the best area. The numbers don't make sense to what you're looking to achieve. Um, and, and I think that the number that you want to look at there, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, is kind of a percentage of owner occupiers to invest in. Is that kind of where you're going with that as well? No. Well, yes and no, yeah. like looking at the numbers, but more about from an emotional perspective. Like, yeah, yeah. I, what I is emotionally? Like, yeah, like how you actually quantify that because, I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's a very subjective kind of – to me, I like to look at an area that's got at least 70% owner occupiers if possible. Um, yeah. does, does that make a bit more sense? Yeah, yeah, 70 – yeah, exactly. Like those type of numbers you need to be watching, but what I was meaning is more around like – um. You know, it's close. It is. It's close to schools. It's got good natural light. These type of things draw real people in that want to bid up prices. Um, let's crack through these at or below intrinsic value. Um, so what we're trying to avoid in this one is new and off the plan apartments, things that have developers margins, kickbacks, commissions in them. That is not buying the property at its intrinsic value. It's buying it above. So what we're trying to do is find properties that actually have value tr truly there at a maybe they're below their replacement costs so what it costs to replace this property is not even as much as i've paid for that property so that means okay. buying properties that are second hand that have a bit of um cleaning up to do it's hard to do that uh by land value if you're buying it's particularly current market. no no not land no not on land value oh, buying okay. below the intrinsic value yeah okay. making yeah, yeah. sure that it's on it's a Two hundred thousand dollar block with a four hundred thousand dollar house on it, and you're spending eight hundred thousand dollars. I mean, eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars because it's <laughs> got developer margins and all that nonsense in it. Yeah. Um, okay, next one: high uh, land to asset ratio. Um, so this doesn't necessarily mean like buying a big block of land. It means having a property that has a whole heap of, I guess. Like, don't buy a block of units that has a hundred, like has a thousand blocks in it. Buy, you know, a fifteen pack of units. Um, so a higher land to asset ratio. Um, well, they say the, they say the values in the land, right? There's a great book by um, Fred Har Fred Harrison by that. Um, I've got to read that one. That's a, that's a great book. So to your point about, <laughs> it's a great book. I haven't read it, but I know it's no, a no, great no, book. No. Yeah, I'm sure I've I've heard, heard fantastic things about it. Okay, so um, yeah, what I'm trying to say there is is um, if you're buying an investment property and there is 15 on there, that means it's on a thousand square meters, a thousand divided by 15. It means you own more asset to that land. What if it's a? Uh, how do you determine land to asset value? There you go. Okay, great. So if there is a a thousand square meter block and it has 200 units on it. Well, that means you've got one two hundredth of that thousand meter block, so you don't really have a large land to asset ratio. Geez, that, that, that's a, that's a very pro development council, Joe. I mean, if they're, if they're allowing two hundred, yeah, no, but you know, you, 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 numbers numbers don't matter. Um, okay, what's the next one? Let's just skip through mine. I'm 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 boring me. Um, oh, no, no, there's so much value. Keep going. I'm gonna. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, number four is a location with a strong history of capital growth. This one is pretty obvious. If it's done, if it's in a place that's done really well before, it's not a predictor of future growth. But if it's yeah, yeah part yeah, it, it it can do really well in the future. Like if it's got all the amenities, if it's got a, a train line, if it's got if it's near water, if it's where people want to live, strong capital growth is going to continue with strong capital growth. Um, number five, look for a property with a twist. Now, um, don't just look for your everyday average property. Look for something unique. Look for something special, something scarce about the property. So this doesn't mean floating floorboards, a new kitchen. I'm talking things like a corner block. They will always be in demand. Developers love them. Um, people looking to uh, add on extra little bits, they love them if you want to cut them up into um and added development on top granny even, flat big frontages those are the things even the jewel, jewel frontage as well joe that is that is the absolute gold mine. oh yeah or or a um a splitter block they're always juicy as well um and then number six let's just round this out um the potential to add value don't buy the end product buy something that you can add value to right now and also get value out of in the future.
Yeah. Those are my six. Should we throw to yeah? Should we throw one of the questions? I think it's uh, good to cover them as we go along. Um, would you look at land asset uh, land asset when buying single property, not units? Do you want to answer that, or did I got a view on that? Do you have a view? Mate, I feel like you've got a good one on that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I want to see who it is. I like talking to somebody. So while I'm looking up who this is, so Jerry, you're absolutely on. I know this oh. is Rebecca. Sorry, Rebecca. <laughs> Sorry, Jez. <laughs> so who um. So no, yeah. So with with this one, yes, I, I, I certainly would. Be, the reason you you would look at that is um, is because let's let's uh, we'll throw to an example. So you've got you've got a, six, a block of six hundred square meters, and you've got a property of four hundred square meters. Like that's a bloody big house for starters. I don't know who's living in a four hundred square meter property. You anyway, probably got. Um, you made yeah. the example up, mate. <laughs> we well, probably got the Brady bunch. Um, but, but yeah, so in, in that in that situation, you sort of you've got the asset there, and that that's a ratio of. So I think you've I don't know what the, what what is it what is it let's let's keep it simple. Let's do eight hundred square meters to four hundred. So you got a you got a one to two, which therefore there's 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 a whole bunch of land, but the asset is covering a lot of that, and and it's going to be hard to do a granny flat. It's going to be hard to do anything. So yes, I would certainly look at that. Because if, particularly if you want to do a subdivision in future, you want to do a granny slab. So yes, it is important even when buying existing property on not units. Someone's jumped in here with an olive branch of help. Land to asset. Click the one that says 800K. We've got a little yeah. bit of a help here. So what have you said here? Land to asset ratio. Oh, yeah. pay 800K and the land value is 400K. You have a land to asset ratio of one to two. New builds would typically have a lower land to asset ratio because the cost of the build is higher land appreciates building depreciate who is that give them a gold star Mitch, you Mitch, I love, love work, mate. You, you've been you've been you've been on board with Oz properties probably about nine or ten months so you're who one of the that? early members and, and i hope that maybe the wisdom soaked in or maybe who knows i'm not going to take credit for it i'm sure mitch is just a clued in bloke so let's get on to no my it's not us <laughs> No, well, I, I think we do add some value here and there. Um, so if I say to myself, so Joe, my session, uh, my little, uh, what I wanted to talk about first up is subdivision. So this is oh, Joe's. This is my renovation. Okay, yours is. Uh, so we, I don't want Joe talking too much. So I, I'm going to, my, my, my subdivision section is going to be very quick. I, I rather than Joe, Joe did notes on pages and pages. Like I love how much preparation he did. I did probably about half half an hour to an hour. I just kind of wanted to talk through it. So I wanted to look at subdivisions and actually look at the strategy, who it's for, and what type of journey they're in for um, when they're doing a subdivision. Because I've done a subdivision, I've done a development, I've done a renovation. So what, is, what is a subdivision, Jeff? Okay, that's simple. Yeah, yeah. So it's not simple, but it's it's something that is often overlooked as to what it is. So um, going back to my example there where you had an 800 square meter block and you had, let's say you had a 250 square meter property um, on it because otherwise you had 400 and it's not going to, so you would, you would then sort of go to council or you'd look at, you talk to your town planners and you say, okay, I want to split this block. I want to subdivide it and then, and then be able to have the ability to put another dwelling on it, um, at, at the back or, or maybe you look, maybe you want to knock it down. Maybe you want to build a duplex side by side, um, there's, there's, so subdividing, essentially splitting up a block um, to enable um, the, the land to be used in a different way. In, in so imagine a pizza. So pizza and property. You've got you've got a pizza, whole pizza before it's cut, and you're just basically cutting up the pizza into multiple slices. That's that's the easiest way. Of <laughs> Is it? <laughs> no, it's just a property with a whole heap of land that's got an extra bit of land that you can cut off and put another property on. Got nothing to do with pizza, mate. Nothing to do with pizza and property. <laughs> Although that is I good will, podcast. To to send me a pizza. So who who is subdivision for? If you've got any questions, look, um, I didn't want to go to because as you say, we're yeah. already about 45 minutes. So who is it for? I would say the more experienced investor, someone with more time or money, someone with more risk appetite, and a person who needs and or wants to force some equity. So I think points one and two are absolutely vital. Um so I, I think you don't necessarily, sorry, points one and four. So you don't necessarily need to be, that's, that, that's uh, you don't always need to be an, an experienced investor. You, if, if you're buying your first property, you want you want to sort of say, okay, well, you want to look to Joe or Jeff or Jill or, or, or Jessica 10 years from now and say, well, what do I want to do with this? So do you need to force some equity? So 
and, and, and you'll thank yourself if you can start to look at these types of properties when you're buying your existing, how to add value. So who it's generally not for? Um, a person who's concerned about risk. So in, in all seriousness, there's not necessarily a lot of risk when you're subdividing. Uh, the only risk is, it, it, is that it gets knocked back and you, you go through and you spend a whole bunch. So the risk is where you're doing to flip it, uh, I would say, and that's a whole different conversation. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. Um, but, but it can be risky in that you don't get it approved. That's probably the key risk with subdivision. Um, someone who is just starting, so it's kind of it's kind of the opposite. And how do you how do you how do you avoid that risk, right? So going back mm -hmm. to what I was talking about with getting professional help, you get yep. experts to help you. So you would do some research on that asset and that area, do the zoning, check what the zoning is. Is it sure. an R three? Is it an R four? Can it be to subdivided? Get what on is, the phone. What is, what, is the, what is the setback limits? What is the what, what is the are setback the, numbers? Yeah, what is the What's setback? The yeah, what is the minimum minimum lot size? Um, minimum all lot size. Things. And before you even start making offers, um, understand if, if that is if that is your purpose, and it'll it'll take you a bit longer. But if if you want to become, if you want to take investing seriously, these are the kind of things that you need to do. Um, and it takes, and that that's what separates you from buying one property or two, as opposed to getting up to three to to six to whatever it is. How many properties you want to own? Um, some of minimal money. So, look, there is a bit of money you do need to sink into to, to organise the plans, and 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 you can probably get away for it somewhere depending on the council between thirty to fifty fifty thousand. So, it's not necessarily that expensive, but you do need to have a little bit of money. And somebody who's not willing to engage professionals as well. Um, so you need to speak yeah. to yourself. Yeah, this yeah. is very much. This is this is leading. This is on the cutting edge of development, right? You are pretty much getting into a development. What I really, really like about subdivisions is that there is a fallback at every point. So what do I mean by that? Well, you buy a property, it has subdividable potential. You call up the town planner. Hey, Mr. Town Planner, um, you know, this thing, can you look at it? It might be worthwhile. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, it can be subdivided. You know, I, I'm not guaranteeing it. Or you can pay him $500, he'll go out to site and say, yes, it can be subdivided. Great. Okay, that's it. You need to, so you can renovate the property. That's one way to add value and get out. Renovate, sell, go. Okay, the next one is renovate, put someone in it. So you're getting cash flow in. And then also um, do the DA, do the development application because developers don't want to do the development application. So you can then do the development application, do the reno, do the development application, and then get out. Yep. Or you can do the development, do the development application, subdivide the block, sell the block, sell the front, sell the back, get out. Or so, so many, so many exit strategies. Yeah. So many exit strategies. Do the development, put the property on there. You make money at every single stage. That is what I love about subdivisions. I think subdivisions yeah. is very underrated. It's not a strategy you hear about a lot, but you can hear a lot about it the, the if you look is, in the right circles. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is that you have to be careful of anybody telling you that you can make money doing it, doing any subdivision. You, you really have to do your numbers. Like you have to do a feasibility. Um, you, you have to you have to understand what the resale value is on that. Um, and as Joe said, there's always if if you're only looking to subdivide, if you're looking if you've got your if you're looking to stack strategies, if you've got your buy and hold, and if you are buy and holding and then decide to subdivide, um, it is a bit more forgiving. But if you are looking to to sort of turn a profit, you need to be very particular and very meticulous on your numbers. So that's on me. Let's go to Reno, Joe. Oh. Good. This is my favorite. What have I got on Reno? Show me the slides. I forgot. Forgot what I wrote. Um, renovation. <laughs> who in the group has done a renovation? Um, who who in this chat has done a re renovation? Pop yes in the comments. And did you make money or did you lose money? I'd love to hear yes and I lost money. It would be awesome to hear that story. Well, I wish we could bring. Well, I wish we could bring people on. Money. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, you, you probably Reno's could, but it just it ended up like a. Okay. Uh, yeah, they, are. they can I love be. That. Look at that. Yeah, they can be. They're they're a big they're a big ish beast. So what what are we trying to do? Yes, Ren made money twice, two times the money. Doing one right now. Oh, sensational. Okay, so um, what is my goal in um renovations? Um, let me just give you a bit of an insight into my last renovation. So, my last deal, 
Um, bought it for two hundred and eighty thousand dollars. I spent thirty thousand. Actually, it was twenty six thousand dollars of the bank's money. Um, turning a two better into a three better. I got it revamped, financed at three hundred sixty nine thousand, um, which gave me fifty nine thousand dollars in equity. It is also a subdividable site. So in the future, so when this is what we're talking about, don't buy the end product. I'm not subdividing it right now. I'm not developing it right now, but I have the opportunity to do that. So I'm not buying the end product. So I made $56,000 in equity. As of last month, when I got it revalued, it's now valued at $420,000. So that is what I'm kind of covering off here. So what I'm trying to say here is make more money, make more, what I, make more perceived value than actual cost. So spend a dollar and make $2 to $3. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to do things that add value. So kitchen, bathrooms, living rooms, bedrooms, they add value. The things that don't add value, sheds, studies, spare rooms, laundries, garages, internal work. So like plumbing and electrical, they don't add much perceived value. So adding a, adding a wall all of a sudden moved my property from... Um, uh, a two better, so the the medium average of two bedrooms into the three bedroom range, um, which is probably it, between yeah. fifty to eighty k, was it? Sorry, between fifty to eighty k value was it, or added value? Ah, uh, well, whatever two. So I spent two eighty on it, and yeah. then and then twenty six k. Some of that's going to be market driven, of course, but um, yeah, oh, a lot of it's market driven. That's why you buy in a good location. But anyway, oh. yeah, eighty nine thousand, I think it was, or something like that. Um, but this is this is what we're kind of talking about. So um, I've written down so much. This is what I do. I write down a whole heap of stuff, and then I can't read it all because I'm in the middle of talking about something else. Hey, um, that's why I just I just have my slides like this. I'm like I don't, I don't yeah like I love how much you put there. I'm just like geez. But I think we need to, I think we need to get people to send this. Uh, we'll, we'll actually, I think we should make these slides available to people. We'll um, we'll get them available. Um, we'll, we'll we'll see some other. I think that's a good value add to people that they can a, a nice takeaway, and then they can look at it and they can they can take it away. Well, I'll, I'll tee that up. So one of the things that I wanted to mention on the renovation side of things is actually what I, no, well, not what I learned from Chris Gray, but what a key point that I took away from his conversation was don't get emotional, right? You're going to look at a hundred properties and there is going to be one deal in there that is actually worthwhile. So you've got to get very good at quickly identifying what is an opportunity, what is not an opportunity and quickly moving on. So, Hey, I'm looking for a property within this price range, which is, you know, 10 to 15 to 20% under the medium value of medium house value. And then I need to be able to add an extra bedroom. Um, uh, so that's what you're going to kind of go for. Then I'm going to look for opportunities that can I renovate the kitchen? Can I renovate the bathroom? Do the floors need polishing? What work needs to be done so I can add that perceived value to give me one to two, three, four dollars back? That's what um, a renovation is. Do you have any tips, Jeff, for renovating? Like, what are your kind of like go-to tips for renovation? Don't build a deck. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm the poster boy for all, all the things not to do on a reno. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've, only, I've only, I've only done one investment reno. I've done, I've done small renos for, for houses that weren't investments. Yeah. Um, but, but mine, um, if I were to do a reno again, I would do mine about 5,000% better than the, than the investment one that I did. Um, so we overcapitalized, didn't understand what, what added value in the area. We trusted, yeah. So we built a deck and just spent way too much on, on shit that didn't make it. And, and I actually, I need to dig back and see what we spent all that on. I've, I've got probably some itemized things. And I, I've been meaning to do a post on it. Just, I've just so many posts I need to do. I keep saying it, but um, yeah. But my, my, my tip is, Basically, follow the the information that necessarily Joe's given, um, and, and really, really understand what adds value in the area. Though you have to you have to look at um, to Jane Sacksmith, and this is kind of my thinking as well. Like, look at what does the area what is, what is actual what is perceived value in the area, and just and just do that. Like, it's not it's not rocket science. If you do a reno in Mossman, I, I think I imagine they're going to want to see stuff like stone bench tops. They're going to, I mean. Whereas if you're doing a reno in, in, in a less kind of uh, fashionable area, uh, maybe putting putting a dishwasher is going to be a renovation that's going to add value to the perceived value to the thing. Like putting okay. a, yeah. So this is my top tip, right? 
I'm not very smart. I I don't really know very much stuff and things. I'm not an area expert. Here is a question here. How do you find the right builder and trades to do your innovation for you? You it find other – it scares the shit out of everyone because there are so many things coming at you and going, this is what I do. I find a location that I like, and that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about location. I then find a property manager. I call up all the property managers in that area, and I want to find someone I actually like speaking to that is engaging. Hey, I'm a property investor. I'm looking to buy in the area. I want to learn a little bit about the hot spots, the not spots. All of a sudden, I've spoken to 10 people, and 10 people have told me that area sucks. Do not go there. The property managers is the key, like just such a high value asset and people just overlook them. So you get a property manager and you say, hey, great, what I'm looking at these properties. I'm looking at this one and this one and this one. And you can quickly identify. They will tell, I'll tell you, don't buy that. No, no, no. That's not a property that, that is going to rent very well. Yeah. Look at the incentives. If you call up a real estate agent and ask these things, their incentive is to sell your property. A, re- a property manager's incentive is to make an easy rental, a person that is going to plop into a property and make it easy to rent. So these guys and girls have so many insights into property management. I, w- I bought my property. I got a property manager to come on site with me and say, hey, Miss Miss Property Manager, I'm looking at this property as, you know, I want to buy it, blah, blah, blah. What do, you, what do I need to do? So, Joe, you need to put a wall right there. Um, that's going to knock out the kitchen. Uh, that's going to knock out a massive chunk of the lounge room. So you need to create another lounge room. So you need to put another air conditioning vent up there. Now that the lounge room is taking up, you've actually taken away the dining room, which means you need to s- install a sliding bench top up here. That'll cost about 150 bucks. In the bedrooms, you need to do this, this, and this. Now in that back room, there's too much damage to the wall. So you need to put wallpaper on. They give you all the information that you need to do. And they yeah. tell you exactly what you have to do. That's what a good property manager will do for you. Yeah. And and, and I suppose you, the property the managers. Is, the, uh, the the caveat that I'll say to that is this is once you've once you've understood that um that, that it is an, an area and a property that you want to buy and it's gonna get capital growth. Um, because property yes. managers that's bef- that's after, yeah, exactly. Yeah, spot on there, Jeff. Spot on. So I want to give a shout, special shout out to Chris. Oh, what a handsome man. Him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Joe's uh, match matchmate. He's he's taken though. Uh, Joe and Chris, they're both taken. Um, so yes, the Renault's um, one. Yeah, there we go. He's. I just wanted to give a shout out to Chris because. Oh like great! Two investment cool. properties. Nice. First Renault fifty k cost increased bank value. There you go. There's your. What's that? That's like one dollar gets you um a dollar. Joe. You don't even need to be good at math to be a property investor. (laughs) (laughs) Double and uh, all right. Um, Well, actually, but hang on. Just before, uh, while we're on the topic of renovation, she um the Facebook user said, "How do I find right builders and trades?" Um, Service mate. Um, what's the other one called? Um, Service seeker. Um, and high pages. Go on to all of those. Submit your brief about what you want. Lay out what you want. One thing that actually really helped me was understanding what the building process is because with a renovation, it's kind of similar. You don't paint the walls. um, You don't bring the carpet in straight away. You've got to kind of paint the walls first. Then you install the carpet. So have a understand that, but um, just get quotes, quotes and quotes and quotes and quotes and quotes um, and see who is the most affordable, who has good references and who is... um, what were, those, what were those things again, Joe? I'm going to answer that comment now. So it's high pages. I'm going to so we make sure we don't lose Service that. Seeker, high Service pages. Seeker. Oh, Air Tasker. So what I did is, okay, and actually another thing with trades, if you want good trade people, always pay on time and, and try and pay cash if you can because you can't offset. A, now, this is definitely not tax advice, but if you haven't got a, I'm not, okay, I've already started Steve, saying Steve, it now. Yeah. No, Speak on. to your account, not financial or advice, but you with a renovation, you can't right. um, do a renovation without tenants in it and claim the tax deduction. So you may as well pay cash to all these people. So what I did is I went on Service Seeker, I went on all these platforms, and I said, hey, um, how much do you charge an hour? I need you for this work. How long is it going to take you? How much is it going to cost? And I already knew. Hey, man, I can, um, I can replace those. I replaced the ceiling. It's going to cost me, you know, $2,000 in materials and $3,000 in labor. Great. Cool. Okay. That's good. Is that a fixed price? Yep. It's a fixed price. I'll get it done. 
Fantastic. Okay, great. 5,000 on the ceiling. And then next person, 4,600. Well, another guy said it was a little bit more. Yeah, but he's doing this, this, and this. I can get around that. Okay, great. I'm happy we do that. So just yeah, keep yeah. chopping around and then just organize it. It doesn't take much. Just you need the like you need the kitchen done. You need this painted. Sorry, mate. I'm going on. Going yeah, on. No, no, no. we've literally only gone for about half an hour and an hour, Joe. So, right. If you want to, if you want to stay till ten thirty, you, you got your Sudoku in bed to play. <laughs> yeah, I'm just yeah. Got so let's Sudoku. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to crack on to to my uh, my next, and then we've got some insights from our lives. And oh, also, uh, yeah. So I want to talk about development. Let's talk about development, baby. Anyway, let's sorry, do it. Sorry. Let's do yeah. it, mate. So quickly, um, because developments, it, 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 we're going to get Rob uh, Rob on in a couple of weeks. So he's going to be he's going to be Rob an absolute master class. He's he's done so many developments. He's seen so many years. So plug like him. But I, I've just recently finished my first and we're soon on my last development. So this is kind of just going to be a quick high level because development is bloody scary or can be scary. Look, I wasn't that scared, but um, I think I'm just I think I'm just a maniac. I'm the guy who will bungee jump um, and just keep bungee jumping until until the cows come. I love it. I love. It. I'm a bit of a thrill seeker, but until the, the table snaps. Yeah, yeah. Until the table, and then I won't be bungee jumping anymore. So um, who is it for? I'm going to talk about at what stage of the journey. The thing I wanted to hit on when you talk about buy and hold, you've got resi and you've got commercial. If you want to go with commercial buy and hold, because that's kind of the evolution of the journey, um, but I, I, I digress. Development, development, focus. So who it's for? The time or cash rich? So if you're time rich, if you've got a lot of time on your hands, if, you, if you've kind of uh, if you've got a, a business that cranks away without... Um, consider really educating yourself on development. Even if you don't have the cash to be able to do so, figure out how to like really learn the trades, understand how it's done because there can be a lot of money made in development. There can be, can be a lot of risk in development as well. Um, but if you've got time and or cash and can outsource a lot of that and, and, and people who are willing to reform due diligence to the next level. So it's not something that you go to and this is who it's not for. I'll hit on that. Um, so if you got to, if you really enjoy due diligence, then you can potentially to my kind of uh, this is what I really do: sit behind a computer and look at numbers and look at well, what is what is what potentially could go wrong. Those who eat, sleep, and breathe property. So I've gone, I've gone on, on the next session. So you have to absolutely because stuff is absolutely going to go wrong. You're going to get delays in finance. You're going to get delays in bills. You're going to you might have trouble selling something. You might there might be something when you hit when you hit rock. Um, on, when you hit, when you break ground, you hit rock. So there's going to be stuff that goes wrong. So you have to, you can't just be somebody who talks about it at the barbecue. You have to be uh, passionate, or you have to be interested in the process and be okay with shit going wrong. Um, and investors who want to speed up in inverted commas. So it's not a get rich quick scheme, um, to my point there, but you can potentially add a whole heap of value. And instead of doing a whole 20 to 25 years, you can cut, you can. You can you can shave sort of up anywhere between five to ten to fifteen years, depending on how adventurous you want to be, and depending on how much time and effort you want to spend on it. So the people that's not so sorry, just just while while you're going through this for the people that are watching and listening to this, have you guys done a development? Are you looking yeah, into a development? It, it would yes. be great to hear if you have got a development gone, if you've done one, what your top insight is and your biggest failing. That would be awesome to hear some of those some some in top top insights and top um, failings that you've – lessons learned maybe. It's maybe a better way to think about it, right? Yeah, you, um, you, either, you either win or you learn, as I say. Yeah. So who is property development not for? So as I say, there's people who are not a get-rich-quick scheme um, because it, it does take – I mean, the one we did took nearly 18 months and we could have shaved probably three to four months of learning for us off that one um so that that it does take time so i would say you even a duplex you should budget in at least nine to 12 months on a duplex from when you when you take ownership of the property um to when you kind of complete like a build you should take at least six months for a simple build anywhere from 12 to and this is assuming that council approves um things relatively easy which in victoria vcat is an absolute pain in a lot of people's sides. I've seen a lot of people, a lot of people who just think it's very easy and are not not uh, first timers. I think you should buy one or two properties or, or at least get some a lot of education, have a lot of uh, hand holding if you're going to do it, um, and, and actually vet those professionals. Somebody who's just attended a two day course on the weekends uh, and thinks now that development is easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Uh, I think that I would caution. 
before I did a development, I did a reno project. I, I bought a couple of properties and I, and I did a whole bunch of education as well. Um, and I even partnered up with somebody as well. I didn't just do a did a development by myself. So you really got to be comfortable with with uh, with outsourcing some of it uh, if you yeah. haven't got yeah, yeah the, yeah. the way I like to think about deals are that there are four components to it. There is one, the person finding the deal. Two, the person funding the deal. Three, the person working the deal. And four, the person with the cash flow for the deal. So every one of those four people get 25% of the income earned. So if you've got, if you're finding the deal and giving cash to the deal, that's 50%. If you're, how do I do this? Funding the deal and um uh, the borrowing capacity you get another 50 percent, and that's how you get a joint venture you can do it with four people and that's how you kind of split up that equity um so, and how you yeah. do that somebody's asked the uh, the elephant in the room how many properties do we do we own um i mean hey I, 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 let's just say it's multi-million uh craig it's more than one and i think for me it's, it's not multi-million million. units <laughs> but it is multi-million dollar value <laughs> yeah, million dollar, yeah. Look, it's it's more than one and, and less less than six uh, at this stage for me. That's that's what I mean. So you can kind of somewhere somewhere in the middle usually. So I reckon somewhere between three and six, I'd say. Um, that's how many, and, and that's not necessarily how many I've purchased, um, Craig, um, and, and and I sold some as well. So, here's a here's a good one. Now you've you've done some joint ventures. Now I'm I'm not in the development space. I'm not purchasing development deals. Um, I'm building up an asset base. So this is yeah. what I like. You and I are doing different things, right? I'm I'm building up my asset base that have development ready opportunities built into them. And then in the yeah. future, I'm going to develop them. But first, I need to build that nest egg and build it to that point. Whereas Jeff, you're going like, hey, where's my develop? Like you just sold your development today. It all settled. Tomorrow you have a pro you have a phone call with a developer to purchase another asset. Like Yes, you just mate, you just fucking signed the deal yesterday, today, and tomorrow yeah. you've already got the development. So, um, well, anyway, but uh, well, where was I going with that? What's the question? Partnership. Any, any, so the deal. Asked, asked a couple of questions. Any advice in going into partnership with someone else? Um, I could literally speak to that for hours on end. Um, and I've done I've done a podcast on. So what it. are the key I'll, learnings? What are the key learnings that you got out of this most recent one when it comes to doing a partnership with someone else? So I think I think for me it's it's really being clear on um, on, on on rather than let things float and, and it's not that things floated but it's it's kind of being uh, being on top of just accepting when something's not going to go um, I, I suppose in a partnership okay so I'm talking about from a who's Jeff a good Michael Carr I don't even need to know who that is um, so advice on going to a partnership I was talking about as a developer so a partnership you just need to you need to, you should get it in writing. Um, I did have a joint venture agreement, so absolute minimum, you've got to have it in writing. Get get as much of it on paper as you can, um, and and probably go to a solicitor. I I would recommend that. Um, and have have multiple exit strategies. Be be, be super clear on the exit strategy, um, and and be it has to be somebody who you um, are comfortable of asking the tough questions with, Valerie. Um, if it's not if it's somebody you ask a tough question with even before you've do, do a whole bunch ask them ask them all that you're essentially forming a partnership with this person so it has to be a, it's really about communication if you're not comfortable communicating with them don't do a deal I, I don't care if the, if the deal's going to make you four million dollars I don't care if it's going to make you four billion dollars if if I'm not comfortable yeah I mean hey but I, if if somebody's going to make my life a living hell. Um, I, I don't want to do a deal with them because it's, it's just not worth it. Like you have to be comfortable asking that person a tough question, um, and ask the tough question after the tough questions up front. That, those are my so two. What are, what are some What are some of the tough questions that you ask them? Well, a tough question is what What happens if 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 we if we can't sell it for what we what we expect to sell it for? What do we do then? Um, because yeah. you don't want to be well, asking look, that. Yeah. We've got four people in this transaction. I'm the borrowing capacity. I find the deal. But who is on the hook if it all falls over? Is it yeah. a four-way split? Is this person getting in trouble the most and having to pay for it? You need to know that question from the beginning, and that's what a joint venture agreement outlines. Yeah, exactly. So, and it's even it's even speaking to um, there's a guy in Melbourne, Lewis Lewis O'Brien, a really good joint venture. Speak speak to a guy like Lewis, or there's people around the country who can kind of look at your joint venture agreement away from and get, and do it do it individually because. These, these people have seen hundreds and maybe thousands of deals and, and where it can go wrong and where there's holes, they'll punch holes. 
in, in your and it, it may not be through malice from the other party or even yourself. Um, so just get 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 it get somebody who's a, an expert to vet your joint venture agreement. That, so have the conversation, put it on paper, and then go to somebody away from the other person. Um, so let's let's kind of get onto the sponsor, Joe, for the next, um, and then we'll get into yeah, mate. Yeah, totally. About that. <laughs> so should, should we? Yeah, should we kind of? Should we? Go let's to get our, to our sponsor. Insights? Actually, you know, actually, hang on. Let's go back to what I was talking about, and we'll we'll roll this in nicely. Um, so we're going back and talking about strategy, right? So Jeff, your strategy is to build an asset base by buying, developing, getting that income, putting it into another deal. Buying, developing, putting that income into another deal. Mine's a little bit different. I'm acquiring the asset base. And then what I'm doing is developing down the line. So then I have six, seven properties that have subdivision potential and development potential that a developer will buy. And then I'm going to sell down my asset base and go into commercial property investing. Because what my job is as a property investor is to replace my income. I want to replace my $120,000, $130,000 salary with property. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to purchase um, income producing assets, which is commercial property. Now, I don't know too much about commercial property, which is why we need to hire experts, which is why we have a sensational sponsor, um, Steve Polisi, who does that. So when I'm looking to sell down my asset base and buy the commercial property, because that's what gives the income, I'm going to reach out to him. Now, we have a sensational little ad here for... Uh, before for that. Uh, actually looking up, Joe, what, what, I, I have a similar approach. It's just kind of, but you're probably just a better, let, let me know when you're ready to jump on the screen. I think you yeah. are ready now. Yeah, Joe, can you do screen? Oh, you can even meet? No, you, can you, you screen have, there? You have to, yeah, so look, okay. I think we need to do another strategy session. You, have, you need to ex you share your screen, I think, Joe. Okay. That's Surely you've done do it before. This is not your first time. Jeez, it's like. Well, you know, you can't be great every time, Jeff. Come on. <laughs> You can't Jeez, expect to use it out of 10 every yeah. time. Yeah. Surely. Surely not. Especially when yeah. we're like, oh, yeah. Let's hey, have stay tuned, folks. We have heaps of value after the break. And we have a whole bunch of commercial I think we're gonna investing. I think one of those areas that confuses many people, probably because of the risks involved, but it's also one of the few asset classes that can give you a very positive cash flow from day one. With commercial property, you get some massive net yields of 6 to 10%. Now, that's not gross. That's the net which means that you're cash in your pocket. This is what makes them so amazing. Your property can actually pay itself off within 10 years, grow in value, and without having you to chip in any cash at all. Now, with big reward comes some big risk, which is why you should de-risk your investment as much as possible. The way you do this is with expert due diligence. This is why we highly recommend hiring professionals to help you along in your investing journey. Steve Polisi of Polisi Property is one such expert. He is one of Australia's top commercial property buyers agent. With his own multi-million dollar property portfolio of a mix of commercial and residential, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He is the guy you want in your corner, crunching the numbers, finding the best properties in the best location, along with the ways to avoid the dud properties. Steve has even been the one to write the book, Commercial Property Investing in Australia, and it's a bestseller. He's been generous enough to give us a massive discount to our audience of 50% with the code OZPROP. Click the link below, get a copy today, and start your commercial property investing journey. Thanks, Joe. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I feel we could have talked more about the strategy, but maybe that's for another. We'll get Joe's screen, remove him there. We're back. We are back. Um, so, yeah, oh, I think definitely. I, th I think there's a lot of value in the strategy. Like, it's interesting yeah. that you have a very different strategy to me, but we're still heading in a good direction, right? <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd say almost the same, not same, but similar direction. The re you're probably just a better saver than me. I, I went, I went, um, I, I went, um, I suppose, I hate, I, I went pissed off overseas for probably many over, and not just you traveled a bit as well, but I, I kind of went for five months and spent kind of the best part of at least one property deposit uh, overseas. And so I kind of, now I'm at the stage where there's there's lifestyle expenses that have crept in, you kind of got all that stuff. So I, that's why I've gone down the joint venture route. Um, but it's eventually, I, I want to be, I will be a buy and hold of more properties. Um, but but that, that dovetails quite nicely into our insights, Joe, from our, from our guests, because we've interviewed 30 plus 
30 plus people on our, on our show. And I just feel every week I, I, I take something from it. Whether I agree with it or not, that's okay if I don't agree with it. So first, I, I actually need to change this screen to back to us because it's a little bit awkward just looking at that. So let's, I think you're first up, are you? Oh, God. It, it is. So here you go. Give, oh. us, give us the first one. Um, okay. This is number one. So oh, this, this is. One, I huh? love it. I love this one. It scares me to definitely talk about this stuff. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is actually one of the best points that I can bring up. Okay. So we're talking about the difference between. Oh, why is it just. just Where'd you go, Jeff? Did I lose you? Oh, God. Device not connected. Um, okay, so um, where am I going with this? So I just recently bought a principal place of residence. So obviously I put my I'll investor back, hat on. I'll be back, Joe. Sorry, man. You're you, back, you, mate. You're back. I just need to take a break. I was trying to be subtle about it. <laughs> right. Okay. I, I you. <laughs> I'll be back. Yeah, okay. Great. <laughs> cool story, mate. Oh, no, you just read your emails. That's fine. You just continue reading your emails. That's what, No, yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is a fucking joke. <laughs> God, mate, what are you doing? Okay, I don't know where I'm going with this. Look, so I bought a principal place of residence, right? Um, what happened is I put an offer on, at the end of November. At the end of November, um, the real estate agent kept playing this game. He kept saying, yeah, yeah, tell me how much it would be. And I said, like, oh, you know, I'll, 750, 750, that's the most amount of um that money I can afford, right? That's all I'm going to do, you know. But if you don't sign this deal by Friday, I'm off. And he's like, yeah, yeah, sure you are, sure you are. The fuck are you doing, Jeff? I'm getting the uh, getting the presentation back up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Just anyway. Don't let, so don't let the show go. Well, yeah, but the sh you're sharing your screen. We're going to all see. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay. <laughs> So essentially what happened is I called up our good friend, Todd Sloan, and I'm like, hey, I'm getting dicked about with this real estate agent. What is going on? Why does it keep happening? And he's like, look, man, the way that this game works is you've got to introduce a time frame, but you can't just say, hey, you need to sign today or I'm walking. They're used to that all the time. You can't play hardball with the agents. And this is something Scott Agate introduces as well, but this is my real life experience from what I experienced having a chat with Todd. So what you need to do is introduce a real time frame by introducing a real property so you the agent is playing a game you need to play a game as well so you need to reverse the fear of loss the agent is trying to sell a property you're a good vendor you so you're a good buyer you want to buy this property so you need to say to this agent hey mr agent I'm when you first walk into the property, check it out, look at the curtains, look at the bloody all the stuff, ask the good questions. Where's the vendor going? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to get out of this? What price will be accepted? Those type of things. Um, and then ask, um, oh, and then casually sprinkle in, hey, by the way, Mr. Agent, um, I'm looking at another property. I'm pretty far well down the line. What would get this property taken off the market? And maybe they'll answer the question and say 760 or 780, whatever it is. Maybe they won't. But what you're trying to do is introduce the fear of loss to them and say, oh, cool. Well, let's see how we go with this. Um, I'm pretty far the way down the line there. Boom. You've planted that seed. And then you can then put the pressure on the agent when you're looking to get it signed up. So this property, November, I put the offer in. December went by. It went over Christmas. So I was trying to get it signed out before them. January went by. And nobody else was bidding on this property. So it was just me bidding against myself. I'll do 750. I'll do 755. Oh, no, the, the vendor's not going to take that. Ah, oh, I'll do 760. Uh, I'll do 765. Uh, it's not good enough. Far out, man. What's going to get this off the market? Well, you tell me because every time you're just bidding against yourself. So what I said was I spoke to Todd Sloan, awesome um, real estate agent has an awesome podcast called pizza and property. And he said, dude, you need to introduce another property. So I'm like, Hey, Mr. Agent, can I come see the property a final time? I just want to check it out. And what I did is I had the flyer of another property under my arm. Hey, I just checked out this property. I didn't actually, I didn't say, Hey, I checked it out. I didn't talk about that. I'm, we're just, Hey, yeah, we're looking around all the properties around the location. Um, and then, and then, um, called him up again and I'm like, hey, man, we're pretty far down the line with this one. Um, you know, what's going to take it off the market? And finally, he started to listen and finally we started to get somewhere. 
And uh, yeah, eventually it's, I got to the point of being like, hey, I've already put an offer on there. Today is the final. I just wanted to give you the heads up. If the vendor wants to accept my price of 780 or whatever it was, I think it was 780, um, then that's what it is. And I'm, I'm done with that, but I'm going to go take this offer. And then anyway, started to wheel and deal and ended up taking it for that price. So you need to, I know it feels really weird. Why does there need to be a property? Why can't two people just buy and sell and transact on a property, but you have to have it. So that was a big lesson that I learned from Scott Agate and from um, Todd Sloan, introduce another property and leverage that and reverse the fear of loss. I just, I just have a big thing about having too much to drink. Okay. <laughs> well, I rambled long enough for nobody to notice. It was so, it was so seamless. Nobody had a clue. Um, yeah, yeah. What is your number one insight from our legends that we have here? So, so this is from uh, Adam, Adam Maney, Chris, Chris Gray and Sam Nguyen. So Sam Nguyen's probably the first guy I mentioned this. And ever since he mentioned it, I, I've started noticing it in pretty much, I'd say, not if not all, but most conversations, is it's they sort of said buying within 50 kilometres of the beach and the coast. Um, and, and now that's not that's not necessarily uh, sort of say that it's going to be a guaranteed investment because, of course, there's going to be places like, uh, I think there's a beach at Port Hedland. So, I mean, as an example, that's a mining town. So be, be careful with generalisations. However, they sort of, I, I, I looked at, like Chris Gray, for example, he looks at properties in sort of Coogee, sort of eastern suburbs. So there's a beach. So there's other drivers there. But Adam as well, he buys kind of somewhere like close to a, a, a bigger sort of city or a, or a coast sort of coastal region. And, and, and Sam as well, he's bought, I think, pretty much – that's one of his key criteria for it. He, it has to be there. That's not his only criteria. He has a whole bunch of other ones. Um, but th that's that's my first insight. Um, do you want to unpack that a little bit, Joe? Hello, Joe? Have we, we've, lost, we've lost show. Oh, just seamless. <laughs> seamless, as they would say. Yeah, yeah sorry. No, that, was, that was a bit awkward. I, I, wasn't watch, I was just watching the presentation. Okay, so, mate. So um, 100%. I totally agree. I think that, that if you want to buy a property in a location that has done really well in the past, that people want to actually buy, it's going to do really well. Um, actually, one of my next top tips, can how many people are in this group right now? Because I feel like I have a lot to talk about and I don't want to just like, do, do you guys want us to continue talking about this? Are we going to, do you want us to continue or, or should we, should, no, I, I'm saying, I'm just saying like, should we save the good stuff for the next session? Um, because we, we said an hour. Yeah. An hour twenty. It's now nine o'clock. God. Oh, Mate, we've got a yes. You, Unfortunately, we got a yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll if, if, you, if you want to see us go on some more, drop, drop the property brothers in the in, in the comments. I want to see property brothers, property brothers, property brothers. We're not the property. Fucking, <laughs> let's go. Let's go and get some. Let's build some bunk beds tonight. Fucking. Let, oh let's God! Make, everyone's like, saying yes. Oh. <laughs> no, fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. Guys. Go on, Joe. Okay. What's well, yeah, number two, mate? You didn't do a number two before you did number one, so go on. <laughs> Jesus. What have I written here? Serious. 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 Oh, well, actually, well, this leverages. Okay, so we've we had this random bloke on. His name's Sam Newen, right? I knew um, it was something special, Joe. I, I've got a, I've got an instinct when some I've got a spidey sense when somebody's got a special story to sell. And, and, and he, he brought the goods. So go on, tell, tell us so all about So this was about, I don't know, it must have been nine months ago when this guy randomly, he posted a massive long thread in the group and just started dropping awesome value and education in our group. And I was just like, who the hell is this guy? And then Jeff reaches out to him. His name's Sam Newen. He buys a lot. He buys property for himself. He's just a general property investor. And that's what we want this group to be about. Property investors talking to a property investor buying property. But this guy dropped some serious value. So one of the things that he said is, you need to be doing serious due diligence. So what did he say? Here are his, his criteria. So I'm not going to try and mince words around. I'm not going to try and mess about. I'm just going to read off my little screen here of what his key things were. He said, you need to have a filter. You need to have a major capital city and be close to water. You need to look for income demographics, people who actually have money that want to continue to spend money you need to go to where the money is now i'm going to speak off 
his conversation here and say, I actually totally agree with that, right? We have seen property double every seven to 10 years on average, right? And that's the whole thing, double seven to 10, blah, blah, blah. You know, it kind of does that thing. It's been doing incredibly well because back in the day, there was single income. Then we got double income and then it's kind of progressed. But are we going to be able to keep doubling property year over year? Because in the year like 2050, property is going to be worth like $50 million. So it's not going to be like that. So what we need to do is go where the money is, go where people are. So one of the things I should have said this at the beginning, one of my key insights is I used to think that you needed to get cash flow positive property straight away. No, you're going to be working a long time and you need to be able to afford the properties that you're purchasing, but you also need capital growth. You need to manufacture that growth yourself by doing a renovation, so adding value to it but also choosing an area that's going to grow really well. The biggest mistake I made was my first property was the most affordable that I could do. I got the smallest amount of deposit that I could get physically and then bought a shit property in a shit location thinking it would go well because it gives me a hundred bucks every week. I don't care about a hundred bucks. I have a real job. I have a real salary. That's what I should be focusing on, getting better at that and then having a property that supports it. Anyway, that's a tangent. What Jeff, uh, what Sam came up with, he said, look, if a suburb is doing 8% growth, that's average, right? A suburb does 8% growth. That's absolutely spectacular. But you need to look at the street level, street by street by street. So what that means is if it's 8%, it means some streets are doing 9.5% and others are doing 7%. So your job as a property investor or a buyer's agent or, you know, this is why buyer's agents are so valuable because they're doing this work is... Um, to find that um, 9.5% street and purchase on that. So you need to um, do that by looking at that. I think he goes, yeah, hang on, I've got the section here. Let me finish this. Think like an owner-occupier. Don't buy in the industrial areas. Owner-occupiers don't want to live there, right? They're not going to get emotional when trucks are driving past. So that was one of his tips. The next one is... Um, go manual street by street on domain. You can actually look up and down the streets on domain. You can do like a street search um, and then you'll be able to tell what's happened. His ruling was um, uh, get an Excel spreadsheet, look at all the properties that haven't been renovated or bought or sold over the last 14 years. So that is two property cycles. You can then start to identify what a true value of a property is in that area and um, how much value it's increased over that period of time. And that's going to give you the higher value streets so you can identify those 9.5% streets. So I thought this is actually one of the best insights that I've gotten out of this group. Yeah, um, and, um, and, and, and the, the, the thing that he, yeah, he actually, he, I think he said he doesn't, he doesn't consider properties that haven't, that haven't transacted in the last 12 years. Yeah, but so, yeah, in that yeah, is it fourteen years in two property oh, cycles? That is um, that is what he's talking about to identify the true property value. Whereas when you add value and you renovate, you can't really count them. Um, so, so yeah, he 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 really brings it, and we're going to get Sam back on. I've been talking oh, to him for, for, for months, but he, he's apparently got some new kind of gold that he looks at. So oh. I'm, I'm kind of teased me a little bit about that, but um, anyway, yeah. let's uh, let's get on to insight number two from me, which is. <laughs> Property is not, and, and I'll get the place spread screen in again. This is a pain in the butt to keep doing this. We've got to, we should just send people the spreadsheet. Um, the, the, yes. the slides. Um, property yes, please is see not, slide number six. <laughs> yeah, slide number 522. Um, property is not a get rich quick or easy screen. Screen, not a screen, it's a scheme. So that, I got that insight from Kate Bakos, Terry Rees, good, our mate Terry, our, our Queenslander mate hurting at the moment uh, up there in Queensland with the old origin get got belts again on Sunday night love to love to throw the boot into the Queenslanders not even going to play game three because you're afraid um, anyway sorry Queenslanders don't hate me too much um Steve Felizzi and Schenker Ramakrishnan Rama, Rama sorry if I've pronounced butch your name so the uh, pretty much I could have just put any guess most guests have all said that um one or two I could say who probably didn't but that's okay um, they probably thought it in their minds. They were just afraid of saying it. Um, so property is not a get rich quick or easy scheme. Like Joe and I have have stories that we've kind of shared in bits and pieces about how we've gone wrong, and 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 now we've kind of coming full circle. We've been doing this now. Kind of, I've been looking at, at property and and 
probably for the last 12 years have been buying property for probably six or seven, actually no longer than that, yeah, seven or eight years now, buying property seven or eight years. Uh, and just kind of looking at those insights now, I, I would sort of say that um, you don't get those insights overnight. Um, you can, um, but you have to understand how to vet those people. Um, and that's those are the kind of insights that are getting. Like Terry, he, he talked about his portfolio. Kate's been doing this for 20-plus years. Steve's been doing it since his in, in, in Nappy Shanker has been just um, absolutely on, on fire in terms of how long he's been um, buying properties as well. So that, that, that epitomises my lesson that I want to impart upon uh, the audience. Okay. Sensational lesson, mate. Property is not a get-rich-quick scheme. It is boring. It is it is one of those – I mean, it's, it's educational. It's kind of fun. Like that's why we created this group, right, because we've got people – on the line, on the line, God, but people that are interested in property. So it's kind of fun just to chat stuff like this, um, but it shouldn't be a gamble, right? It shouldn't be too exciting. It's just the tortoise or the hare. The tortoise will look at the next shiny object and sprint over there, get exhausted, have a nap, get bored. But the tortoise just keeps plugging away, right? Just keeps going and going and going until he gets his investment. That's what property investment should be. On to the next one. Like what you're doing, Jeff. You spoke about the development, yet you've signed your development today. I just can't believe that. And then now you're speaking about the next one tomorrow. And yeah. you just got to keep going on and you will eventually I mean, it's, get it's we, we, with, with things like development, people think that you can just knock it out in in, in, in six months. Like I, I challenge anybody, like I don't know, maybe in, maybe in part, other parts of the world, I can do it that quickly. Yeah. Um, but in, in Australia, we have yeah. yeah. So I, I kind of think even development, development is is a not a get rich quick scheme either. It's it's a hard slog to do it, and and it's and it's risk and, and that kind of thing as well. Um, yeah. On to the last insight. Well, this one's from an accountant, and I'm not going to mention his last name because it's I don't think it. In, I mean, you're, in, in, in Mazzelli. In Mazzelli. In Mazzelli. Okay, yeah. Jeremy in Mazzelli. In Mazzelli. Yeah. So um, one of the key in insights. So that, that's that's supposed to be an M, isn't it? Oh, uh, mate, I copied it from his LinkedIn, so I wouldn't, oh, yeah, wouldn't you're right. it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that, that he was really on about was cash buffers. So he said, aim to have 10% of cash buffers in your portfolio. So if you have a million dollars worth of debt, have a million dollar. If you have a million dollar portfolio, have a million, have a hundred thousand dollars worth of um, buffer. Now you for me... That's massive. That's very healthy. For me at my stage of life, um, I haven't got a buffer that big because I think it's leaving a little bit too much for um, – it's leaving – Too much money. Too much how things. to drive. Yeah. yeah. But one of, the, one of the things that it really set in stone for me is like you need to have cash buffers and you need to know how much your properties are costing you and just put that money aside for the year. Every single year, this property – is going to cost like obviously you've done the numbers you've worked it out i'm going to get five hundred dollars a week of rent it's going to cost me you know x amount of dollars for the mortgage i'm going to factor five percent fixing it up and all that stuff and then say okay great well that's going to cost me six grand for the year which doesn't sound like much like which sounds like a lot but six thousand dollars divided by 12 is that's going to cost me five hundred dollars a month okay well put that money away put x amount of dollars away three months six months of expenses away in a bank account um, and then just have a cash buffer at each property and then you don't have to worry about it and you don't have to stress out. You can be like, okay, great. I could lose my job today and I've got six months worth of cash buffers. I lose my job and people jump out of the properties and it's vacant. How long can I survive? Yeah. I mean, and, and particularly given what we've sort of seen the last 12 or 18 months with the, with the pandemic and, and it'll, it'll happen again. I'm not saying there'll be a pandemic again. I mean, maybe there maybe will be in human history. Um, but but yeah, how, what kind of cash buffers, the people that are watching right now, you're obviously keen property investors. What kind of cash buffers do you put? Do you have a percentage? Do you have a number? Um, do you have a month number? Uh, how do you work it out? How do you work out cash buffers? Yeah, we'd love to, the, the value of the collective. So on to my that mate, I love that. Uh, that that's that's a, that's a great one. So I'd love it's to see risk it. from an accountant. So it's all about risk. <laughs> a, a great, a great accountant, a great accountant at that as well. So um, he is in demand. Seriously. So this this for me is a mother of all insights. So data is great, but dig beyond the data. So everybody's like, oh, you know, you have to do you have to do data. Data only. Data is king. 
Um, and then there's other people that's like, no, no, data doesn't mean anything. They're like, oh, you have to go there on the ground. I'd say data is probably one of the mo one of the most and one of the more important things to the, the, to, to do and to look at. Um, but you have to dig beyond it. In, and this was sort of brought up by Arjun for the Property Nerds, um, Jane Slack Smith, Jacob Field from Ripe House as well. Just kind of, um, and they, they even talked about digging beyond the data. Like Arjun goes around the country and visits, uh, he does a property kind of tour when, when the borders aren't closed every uh, every kind of couple of months. He, he goes and checks checks the place out. He builds the relationships. He, he understands the areas as, as well. So um, that, that to me is, and what I mean by that is you have to kind of look because data is only one one side of the equation. It's not some, um, you have to sort of, because it can tell, Data is it is a number, but it but data does lie. I mean, median house price is, is a very is an imperfect measure because if you've only got ten properties to transact in a suburb in a year, then all it takes is is two or three properties to sell at at uh, or four three or four properties of those to sell at three million dollars, and then and then and then uh, let's say two properties to sell at three or four hundred thousand. Uh, and then, and then let's say, yeah, and then one or two properties sold two million. Next minute, the median is two million dollars. So that's just the kind of uh, why it's important to dig beyond the data and and look at the trends of the data as well. So that's that's my kind of. What are your thoughts on that, Joe? Mate, I'm all about the data. I think um, that is one of the key lessons that I've learned from having these property investors on and these data junkies of Jacob Field, um, James Slack Smith, um, and Arjun. We're going to Ken. Kent Lardner on the show as well, who is the uh, okay. core data man, is yeah. that um, this stuff has a trend. It's e it's not easy to spot, but it's just the inflow and outflow of people. And it's very um, – there are, there are things that you can look out for, like uh, supply and demand. You can look at – the change that interest rates have. You can look at um, rental vacancies. You can look at these type of things and these all put pressure on certain areas that add to capital growth and capital appreciation within the um, within um, property. So uh, I'm all about the data, man. What are some of your kind of core data's ta core data metrics that you look at? Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love the audience to 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 throw, um, yeah, throw throw, throw you what, what things you look at. So for me, the, the one of the key ones I look at, we talked spoke about it earlier, is owner occupied percentage. So to me, it's got to be above, it's got to be at least seventy percent, um, ideally more, but seventy percent is a minimum benchmark. The reason I do is because otherwise, I, I don't I don't want investors to be making investor. And best sources, the best data sources. Uh, anyway, we've got heaps of questions. Um, we're already we're already at one thirty seven. Jesus, mate, this is going to be a two hour session. Um, but anyway, so yeah, yeah. No, we've we got to we, we end this thing soon. We'll. we'll I want to hear some questions. So, guys, um, yeah. we pretty much the, this session we've kind of covered off a lot of what we want to talk about. Now, the next is just answer any questions that you guys have. So, pop them in the questions. I still want to keep this data conversation going because I think there's a lot to unpack in that. So, pop any yeah. questions in there. Um, oh, hurry out. Chris, he's gone and asked the question. Best data sources to search for we, we, we actually had a top three platforms we were going to share because Joe was like, oh, we're not yeah. going to have enough content. I'm like, mate, this is going to go for, for years, this session. Um, do you want to throw your top three out there, Joe? No. Oh, Okay, oh. uh, well, Joe's looking for these because I, I, I don't bother. I just, I just write them down and I remember them. So my, my, my sort of top three, no particular order, I go property nerds. Um, they're tweaking the algorithm a little bit. So, Arjun, if, you, if you're watching, I, I, know you got to, and Ken, I know you've got to make some money, um, but, but make some more stuff free again. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah so the, the most important one was supply and demand. That was the key metric. How much is supply? What is the demand for that? And then they got rid of it. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, they've got to... It's, obviously, it's, they've uh, got to make money. It's a shitload of data. But um, that's where... That was the most important metric that you need to worry about within that. Yeah. So the uh, so the other the other platform I would sort of say is uh, is is Core Logic, which somebody's brought up. Data in Core Logic is universally available. So what data can we use to be competitive advantage? It's not so much in the data; it's about the way that you look at the data because people just jump on realestate.com or Core Logic or whatever it is. They look at the, the the median house price and they say, "Oh, great, okay, Hobart's gone up, or Darwin's gone up twenty percent last year. I'm going to go and buy in Darwin." But they then they then say, okay, well, what is actually what is the what is the story behind the data? What is it that um, so core logic is a good one for me. Um, I, I, I like to sort of combine it, and the other one I like to look at for just a, a very quick and quick and dirty 
an easy, um, and it's not one I would make any investment decisions on, but just to kind of start to filter is smart property investment. I like some of those numbers. And then really look at look at the raw data from where that comes from. So they're, they're my top three. What, what are your thoughts, Joe, quickly? Um, my thoughts are I don't like smart property investment. I don't feel like their data is actually real. So I'm going to... Th- oh, you think they make it up? No, okay. I don't think they make it up, but I just think it's shit. Um, okay. <laughs> so sorry about that, mate. Like I would not make it... Like you look at like the good data you stole, sources. You stole my one. That's why I had to, I had to go I for stole your thunder. my ones. I wanted, um, to, I wanted to pick some of the ones that you chose, but yeah. Uh, well, okay, so the ones that I'm trying to find that one. There was one that um, JJB mentioned. The the to find. Oh to, yeah. There's a platform planning called. Alerts? Huh. Planning alerts or was it? No, uh, no, no, no. It wasn't yeah. planning alerts. It was something dot org. Uh, actually, that's planning alerts. Is a dot org. Um, but no, there's a one called Archistar, which is actually a company I used to work at. They do a fantastic modeling, and it tells you where all the. I'll, find um, it. I'll drop it in the comments. Them, yeah, uh, find it. Um, but they do. You can see what is R one, what is R two, what is R three, what is zoned urban, um, you know, whatever residential and all that fun stuff. Anyway, my top platforms is that one with JJB. I forgot what the name is, but it allows you to search all the locations for what um, side of the street is more valuable. Right? If, some, if something's vo- voted, if it's something in council is vet better development potential an R3 over an R2, then I'm more likely to head over here because there's going to be more of a bigger upsell when I eventually develop it because I can develop something more. So a developer is more likely to knock on my door in an R3 than an R2, so I'm more likely to go that. Um, The next one is microburbs. Um, If you guys have not heard of microburbs, you need to jump on it. That is sensational for digesting and understanding the demographics of an area. It'll tell you the crime rate. It'll tell you how many um, uh, people are in... Uh, public housing, how many people are in, um, how many crimes have been committed, uh, how many parents there are, how many old people there are, the hipness score, where the cafes are, all of that kind of stuff. So microburbs is an amazing resource. Doesn't seem to update, though. The data is old. Well, the problem is they use a lot of the resources from the census, and the last yeah. census was bloody ages ago. So, We're having one coming up in a couple of months. 20, uh, when is it? 2022, isn't it? Um, no, no, 2021. I was supposed to have it in 2020, but, but it's supposed to be, it's every four years. So, yeah, it is a little old in the microburbs, but with this new census data, it's going to come up. <laughs> Cop that. <laughs> um, Joe's getting, Joe's getting heckled. Can you guys do another session just like this one? Oh, that makes me feel oh, good. Next week, please. We've already got our, our fantastic guest booked in next week. Uh, He's going to blow your socks off. What's um, my third one? What was my third one? Oh, local. Yeah, uh, Locations Actually, I've got I've got two more. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get jelly here. I mean, not not jelly, not jealous. What's the other thing? Greedy. That's what I'm gonna get. Um, you're gonna take two more. One is paid. One is free. Walk score is the free one. That is awesome to identify the walking walkability of your property. <laughs> not gonna not gonna bring that comment up. Um, but walk score is a sensational free platform. You plug in the actual location of your property and it will tell you how close it is to stuff. So is it walkable? So if you look at a place that's like for older people, maybe they want to be closer to a bus stop or they want to be closer to, um, um, you know, a, a shop. Um, the next one that is free to really give you a general understanding is location score, which is done by the guys over at DSR Data. You pay about $150 a quarter, which is every three months, and it tells you all the supply and demand. It's got, it gives you a kind of a barometer for the locations, um, what kind of supply they've got, what kind of vacancy rates. So it's so cheap. It's so affordable. Like a property investment, you're, you're putting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in, spend a couple of hundred and a couple of thousand dollars by finding the right info. I'm kicking you off, Joe. I'm, I'm getting into the audience, the pre-asked question. So we're, we're, start, we're, start, we're starting to wrap it up. So, um, but, but yeah, we're just, we'll be here for another two hours. So you, you, you've got plenty of time to ask your questions. Um, so the, the question, I'm, I'm happy to take this one because I did some research, I did some thinking, um, BN10, um, so I tagged you there, so it'll come up. They asked resi versus commercial, when diversify, when to diversify the portfolio, growth area is expected for each state. That's that's a session in itself. But let's 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 answer this in I'm gonna run through this in two minutes. 
Um, and then, and then I'll give Joe five. I'll, I'll give Joe five ses- uh, Five. I'll give Joe probably uh, thirty seconds to run as well. Resi versus commercial depends on um, what what stage of the journey you're at. I think commercial upfront is hard to do. Um, Steve Felizzi did a post on that, so uh, I would say resi generally, but depends on your circumstances, of course. When to diversify the portfolio. Uh, depends on what diversity means, um, diverse, diversification means, of course. Um, I think is it is it resi versus commercial? I think I already answered that. If it's different states, um, yeah, I think that kind of comes down to what's your um, what your how much what your budget is, uh, how comfortable you are buying in the state as well. So, um, all those kind of things. Growth areas. I'm going to run around the. I actually, I, I wrote down some uh, states. So just very quickly. Oh, Queensland, I'm just going to do this in like literally 30 seconds. So Queensland, house of, I, I said house within 15 kilometres of Brisbane. Um, I don't like too much else outside of that. Um, other people are going to disagree. That's okay. Um, this is what I would feel comfortable with. Depends on your budget, um, of course. New South Wales, I like some of the regions. I like places like, I know I haven't done research on these. These are not specific recommendations. Um, do your own due diligence, yada, yada. Uh, I like Central Coast and South Coast. Um, there's seen a lot of price growth in those areas, um, so you have to really dig and understand. I like some of the regional, for other regionals like your Armadales um, and some of those other ones as well. ACT, fairly hot market. Consider sort of West Canberra where you can still see some potential value. South side Land as well. Tax, though. Land yeah, tax you should is not tax. Um, you like um, belt, you like Queen Bean because Queen Bean's yeah. looking really juicy at the moment. Yeah. Um, yep, just a quick run around the country. Uh, regionals: Victoria, I said Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong, or Latrobe Valley, um, Gippsland. I think if cash flow is a focus. Um, Tassie, I didn't do too much on that because it's I don't know enough about Tassie. Um, South Australia, I said Port Adelaide, um, pockets such as Queenstown, Rosewater. Um, you have to be careful with those areas. Um, same with inner west, I said, sorry, inner north of Adelaide, Ingle Farm, St. Mary's. Um, be careful because you want to, you need to really do research in those areas. Um, WA, I said, Safety Bay. I know a couple of bought down there. That's where Julie White as well. I've not, I've not researched that market, so don't, you have to, I've never bought a prop in WA, so. Um, hey, what are you giving out recommendations for? I've no, done no, no research on the area. Reason, so I know I'm nothing sure about it. And I don't recommend it, but buy that. No, 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 no. Well, what I'm saying is people wanted to say where there's areas. So I, I was throwing some areas I'm seeing people Fucking buy areas everywhere. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so Northern Territory, again, I'm not familiar with Northern Territory. So, so that's my quick run through. Big disclaimer, I've not um, want to do a joint venture together. Yeah, so that's – I'm going to get on to the next question. Um, thoughts, show, but while I'm looking at the next question. Okay, well, I'll answer this one. Um, residential versus commercial, when to diversify. Again, I, I, I mentioned this before. My, my strategy is to get a sizable portfolio, develop that in a, in a way that's going to allow me to sell it down to then go into commercial. So I would use commercial as a vehicle, as an end state, right? The goal is to replace your income. The best income producing asset that I can find that I can leverage is commercial. Now, Joe, why don't you just get into commercial right now? Because it's the end state. Well, commercial is a bit of an asset that requires a large deposit. Um, So what I like to think about it is residential is all about growth and getting a big asset base. Um, It's not for cash flow. I, you can get good cash flow. You can do like those splitter houses and you can have rooming houses and all that stuff. No, I'm going to just stick to commercial for my my um, my income. So, um, yeah, that's what it, yeah. Um, so okay, man, I, let me smash through some, let's smash through some. You guys want to yeah, do a joint sure. venture? I want to ask a question about 400K cash to spend and needed a good yield. Um Look back at those um, some of those regionals I suggested, Alan, um, did, did, did a research and there's actually it's really a tool I tag you in that'll tell you about uh, areas you can pick up properties for 400K um, and then do research from there. Um, and then we've got one around how to – so Zach and Matt, I'm just going to – Quickly, um, yeah. Look, if you've got any let's, thoughts, let's about do the real. Let's do the real questions for people that are actually in this conversation right now, um, and knock through them, guys. Any other question? I'm I'm going to go to bed soon, so um, <laughs> I just want to answer a couple and and go. go. <laughs> I'll see you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an hour 50. This is ridiculous. I can't believe you guys are still here. I really appreciate you. I, I, 
I, it's, it's really cool to think people are actually sitting here watching this getting I, I told you we had too much, Joe, and you didn't believe I, me. I, went, I, I was like, rant yeah. Rant. 100% I wrote way too much stuff and I did yeah. I'm like no no we don't have enough stone I'm just going to keep value value add uh, <laughs> thanks guys um, why do you yeah. need to sell down resi leverage equity on your residential properties yeah absolutely you could do that so you could That's you could scary. have um, so one it's uh, a great question really one of the questions is is do you sell it down and then you know capitalize pay the capital gains tax on that um why don't you just use the equity that you've got in there to be able to do that well yeah great bloody question why don't i do that um one the way i see it is um i'm i'm going to get more income out of that asset and that's going to be the stage of life where i want to and two i'm giving myself the option right i'm purchasing properties like that's my like what happens is things get very blurry towards the tail end. I know where I want to be, but the way I'm going to get there is getting blurrier and blurrier and blurrier as it gets to the time being. So for me, that's my strategy right now to Sorry, sell it all. But I could we'll actually, yeah. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll coach you off this. It's okay, Joe. I'll, oh, I'll, thanks, I'll, man. I'll <laughs> thanks, man. No, no. But yes, I'll, you can leverage. But the whole point would be to have an asset base that would be a, that I could sell down to then go into commercial and put it all into commercial rather than fifty percent in resi, fifty percent in commercial. However, of course, that's an option, and that might be what it turns into. But what I'm doing is giving myself the opportunity to get to that point, and then I can make that decision when I'm when I'm there already and be able to do that. So. I don't have to make that decision right now. I don't have to say I'm definitely going to sell. Well, I'm saying it right now, but in, you know, in in those years' time, yeah. So that's actually a really good question. So um, I, I think um, I think I think I think Jerry, my the 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 answer or my and, and there's no right or wrong answer to this. Um, my views on this is yes, you can keep the resi, um, not advice. Um, go and speak to all, all all the good folks. Go and take take these things. The, it depends on what your time frame is. If, if, you, if you want to retire in two years or three years, keeping that resi and drawing equity is then going to mean if that's going to, that's going to mean that you might not hit that target. Whereas if you've got 10, 15, 20 years, um, and if you, can, if you can draw equity out of the resi and then re redeploy that into a commercial, then, then maybe that is, it is an option. So it, it, it kind of comes down to what you, your why, what you want to achieve and when you want to achieve it. Um, because I, I don't know, I, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not so fussed about um, working necessarily for somebody else. So for me, I would kind of be more open to unencumbered kind of property because then, then I, then I'm not, then I'm not beholden to somebody else. I, because debt, debt is, um, it's a mortgage, right? It's a mort, uh, It's from the French kind of thing about till death. Um, so you have more, having more, having debt, and having mortgage. Um, can mean that you're still stuck in uh, in your in your own. If you want to go and leave and do, do whatever it is you want to do, if you want to go and do some underwater basket weaving. I don't want to do that, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah, I love it. Okay, um, one, one, okay, one, well, one more question. Let's let's do one or two, Joe. Come on, one, one or yeah, two. Yeah, well, let's do the question. Don't insert comments from other people in no, no, answer no, the no, questions no, that we have no, in the group no, already otherwise it defeats the purpose of me doing these monday and tuesday posts because otherwise uh, i want to get questions because otherwise we don't always have a heap of questions so throw throw your questions down below or throw what you um what you want to see more of next time or, or what, what what you would want to see less of uh, maybe me talking about underwater bus basket weaving um but there was a question though that i thought was fantastic about how to improve serviceability um, and I think that's that's a question that everybody that everybody wants that wants to know how to do that. And and I sort of I was uh, I said in jest to somebody offline. They said, "Oh, the way to do it is earn more money or spend less. It's simple, right? That's that's the way you do it. Earn more, spend less. What, easy. What more yeah, easy. But there is a little bit more than that to that. Adam, maybe um, I got to go, but once more of the same again. Jesus, that's a bit that's a bit worrisome." Um, so the Adam Maney spoke about resetting your loan term. Now, again, this may not be for you if, if you've got existing property. So say you've got a loan that's, that you've had for 10 years and you've been paying it down, you've been paying it down, and that's for you for you to increase your borrowing capacity. What you, one, one option you may want to con you may consider after speaking to your broker, go to them and say, hey, look, um, I want to sort of increase my borrowing capacity. 
you can you can go and refinance that to, to a 30 year loan which then reduces uh, but but keep the debt the same uh, and, and then that'll reduce your repayments increase how much you can borrow because right and, and that that reduces your monthly repayments and of course we'll well of course he's a broker to do this um, I was a broker my time. Um, but, but what that means is, of course, you'll increase how much interest you pay. So there's, it's not all kind of uh, sunshine, rainbows and lollipops. So there are downsides to that strategy as well. But it kind of depends on what you want to achieve. The other one is... Uh, if you yeah, had to boil that down into a couple of points, what what would those points be? Um, increasing serviceability or... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. So consider... Consider, and I made a made some comments on this. Um, so I said resetting commercial property deposit depending. So commercial property, you can do things like lease stock loans. Um, yeah, there's definitely downsides to lease stock loans. I'll let Pelizzi speak about that um, some stage. Consider second and third tier lenders uh, and or increased deposit. So if you increase deposit um, to twenty percent, sometimes thirty, um, you can over, you can overcome some of the um, some of the the uh, serviceability issues. And also consider work with, working with your accountants about a broker about structures as well, cost first benefit analysis on the how much it costs to um, set up and maintain the structures. Cost a lot. It's the answer. It does. Yeah, yeah, of course. A lot of value. At yeah. Times. So what's the uh, yeah what's what's the benefit to, to having that structure in place? Joe's absolutely cooked. I can just see him right now. I don't even need him to tell me. He's he's done. So we've got one lucky last question. If you want, if you want. I think what we can do is let's get the slide deck. Let's get out. Let's get the slide deck to the people. I think there's so much value in your slides, Joe. Um, I, I think let's find a way. Like we'll, we'll find a way to opt in. You just hit want... sharing link and post it in the comments. Hit share yeah, link. Anyone I mean, can view. I want. I want. I'm a little greedy. I want. I, I want. I'm a little kind of. I want. I want to. I'm a little kind of. Uh, I want people to be able to keep getting our content. So we've got a newsletter as well. Um, oh, yeah. So. Yeah, let's let's kind of let's give if, if people want to, um, we'll, we'll we'll do a link up to the slides, um, and the way people can get that is um, by dropping their dropping their details. If, and there's so much value in those slides. Um, but yeah, one last if if you want to want us to do another session, drop yes, um, and um, let's do one last question. Any burning question, we'll do our best to answer it. As long as it's not um, who is our favourite. Um, I don't know. Yeah, what's your OnlyFans account is probably not one we're going to answer. Um, yeah, wherever that was in the comments, uh, um, it's locked. That's the question. That's the answer. Uh, <laughs> no, sign me up. Sign me up. But but let Joe yes, sleep. But let Joe sleep. <laughs> yes. I don't know. I just want. I want to see honestly. Joe, go. How long can Joe go? No. Um, so it looks like we're kind of. I think we're. Okay. What's the question, mate? Give us the question. What's the question? Have you guys got? I don't any know. Questions? I want the audience. I want, I want the audience to bring the. Question oh. Out. Oh yeah, right, sorry. right, right. Yeah. Um. Okay. So question. um. Hey, one thing that I wanted to talk about on the broker side of things was around um, what I kind of hear. Now, I'm not a mortgage broker. I'm not an expert in this area. But one of the things was like, Max, what are your thoughts on this, actually? Jeff, I'll ask you, as an ex-broker, what are um, you purchase a property for the big four lenders and you max out your borrowing capacity? With your borrowing capacity with those guys, oh look at that! You've even got the 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 property investing dot Substack. Well done, mate. Um, yeah. But how do you do it? So you purchase, you know, one, two, three, four, five properties with the top tier lenders until you max out your borrowing capacity, and then you start to trickle down into the second, third, fourth tier lenders. Is that the way to do it? That's uh, that's yeah, the simplest way to do it. I mean, it's not it's not really that any more complicated than that. Um, the, I, was, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and they they spoke about. Um, sorry, I'm still sharing, aren't I? I am, so people can see. I'll get rid of that sharing. Um, so the the, cha the challenge that you have is once you go to those second and third tier lenders, is it can be challenging to refinance um, once once that happens, and and once once you're there, they can they they sort of know that you're going to them because you're um so yeah for one last question uh, and they're the, more expensive second third fourth tier lenders are, are more expensive. Be, not, not always but yeah then uh, most of the time they are and, and they sort of know that you're going there because you either got an issue with your credit or you sort of can't go you can't borrow anywhere else so if they increase the rate and 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 you know like and if rba increase the cash rate as well um then then kind of then then it's sort of are you stretching yourself too thin so you have to be a little careful with that strategy, but just if you're going to do that, really uh, focus on one of the tips that 
Uh, Joe mentioned earlier yeah, the buffer. Have, have a buffer in place. Crunch your numbers if buffer, it's going to be buffer, 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 buffer. Um, like, so, yeah. Actually, there was someone. There was someone up here that that, that when we we're talking about buffers, they said they have a sick. They they count their properties at a um, six percent mortgage, which I think is a great idea. If your deal I'll can go seven, seven, seven and a half, because um, that's what the banks used to do it at. So, well, what are they doing now? Uh, between six and oh, sorry, well, there you go. Five, he's five. he's more into it, mate. He's more attuned to what the banks are doing. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. Eventually, it'll yeah. We've seen Four now six rates today, so that's that's a, that's a sign. Um, um, but yeah. So yeah, another one was I have twelve weeks worth of buffer, so twelve weeks worth of rent for my buffer. I think that's a great idea. Set a number of weeks, twelve weeks. Um, fantastic. Um, do we have another yeah, comment? I think, I think we're good. Um, I think we're oh, good, guys. There's, there's not, go to sleep. Not... Why don't we end it in 10 seconds and then we've gone for exactly two hours? Jesus, help us. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll finish. Oh, can we do it exactly on two hours? No, oh, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, we're not. No, no, no. Oh, okay. I was going to finish. So I, I wanted to, if, if you want to, we've got a newsletter that we, we publish every second Sunday of, sorry. It's no, once a second. month. You get one, you get, it's every... once a month. And these, all it is, is the distilled data and information from all the guests and all the lives. We go through them, we pull out all the top resources from them, and provide a little bit of value for the group. Um, We've got Adam as well. Ta uh, oh, did he, he's already left. Yeah, he gives us a great location, a location score. Um, thank you very much, guys, for attending and staying. It was really cool. It's fun. I love the engagement. Yeah. Right, that's what it's all about. It's cool to be like you know chatting to people online and doing all that fun stuff so um yeah subscribe to the newsletter it's it's no there's no spam there's no bullshit it's just hey this is the guest like i understand that you don't always have two hours on a wednesday night to watch this so it's all just distilled data from from that so jump onto that yeah um, the, other, the, other, the other thing i just wanted to finish off with people that are sort of in uh, and under lockdown and sort of doing all that and um yeah if, if you ever i mean reach out to me if you ever need it um I, I, and just let me know that that's the reason why you're reaching out um just want to make sure that that we can kind of support people as well it's not just about uh, making a whole bunch of money hopefully um but um yeah it's kind of about being community for the for the tribe um yeah because people reach out to me occasionally and i sort of say oh, look, i'll get back to you in two weeks and i joke about that but sometimes it does take me two weeks and i'm sorry i'm, I'm not sorry about that but um it, it just I, I only have so much time in my day people but uh, i love to help as much as i can so what are your final thoughts joe I think it went for way too long. I think two hours is a crazy <laughs> amount of time. Yeah, um, yeah. But <laughs> but um, I think we can distill it down. Thing. But it makes it fun. We were engaging. Like people were talking. So I, I had a blast, guys. Thank you very much. Um, so we end this. We always end oh, it with the oh, same way. Let's go buy a property. That's how <laughs> we end this thing. Let's go buy a property. See you guys later. Hey, Have a great day. Have a great evening. Bye.